We're just past the two-minute mark in the countdown. T-minus one minute, 54 seconds, and counting. Our status board indicates that the oxidizer tanks in the second and third stages now have pressurized. We continue to build up pressure in all three stages uh, here at the last minute uh, to prepare it for liftoff. T-minus one minute, 35 seconds on the Apollo mission, the flight to land the first men on the moon. All indications uh, coming in uh, to the control center at this time indicate we are full. One minute, 25 seconds in counting. Our status board indicates the third stage completely pressurized. 80-second mark has now been passed. We'll go on full internal power at the 50-second mark in the countdown. Guidance system goes on internal at 17 seconds, leading up to the ignition sequence at 8.9 seconds. We're approaching the 60-second mark on the Apollo 11 mission. T-minus 60 seconds and counting. We pass T-minus 60. 55 seconds and counting. Neil Armstrong just reported back. It's been a real smooth countdown. We passed the 50-second mark. Power transfer is complete. We're on internal power with the launch vehicle at this time. 40 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. seconds and counting. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Hi, I'm Mike Collins. Uh, Fifty years ago, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and I uh, suited up in this very room. At that time, we were on our way to make uh, history with Apollo 11, the first lunar landing. There they are, the men of Apollo 11, immortalized in bronze, a seven-foot-tall statue outside the Saturn V Center at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Meanwhile, inside the Saturn V Center, we welcome you to our show about NASA's giant leaps past and present. Hello, everyone. I'm Daryl Nail. And I'm Marie Lewis, and we are sitting underneath the Saturn V rocket just behind us. It's the most powerful ever flown. The Saturn V, 7.6 million pounds of thrust, propelled Apollo 11 and a total of 24 American astronauts to the moon. And America's next giant leap to the moon will blast off from right here in Florida. And we have teams of broadcasters, astronauts, and other guests across the country to help us honor history. You see them there. They will also help us project the future. We'll take you to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, to Neil Armstrong's hometown of Wapakoneta, Ohio, to the Museum of Flight in Seattle, and to some special guest. Hey, is that Adam Savage there? Yeah, from Mythbusters. Oh, I see him there. They are on the National Mall. In Washington, D.C. And I'm Karen Fox from NASA. In just a few minutes, we'll be talking live with Apollo 11 astronauts Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. Hi, everyone. My Back name is the Kennedy Sp Danielle dallas Russa, and I'm beyond thrilled to be here at the Kennedy Space Center to be celebrating the Apollo 11 anniversary, where we're going to be celebrating and taking your questions and comments on social media. We're even going to be interviewing people live at this center. If we don't get around to your questions or comments on this show, don't worry. We have a team on standby ready to respond to you. All you have to do is remember to the hashtag Apollo 50th. All right, thanks, Danielle. The 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 is, of course, why we're here today. We begin with our first look at the remarkable historic achievement that the whole world is celebrating. That giant leap changed history and helped create the world we live in today. 
Okay, it's go there. Capcom on the hot fire. Okay, off come on the hot fire. Okay, off go, no, go for undocking. Okay, retro, go. Fido, go. Guide, go. Control, go. Telcom, go. GNC, go. Ecom, go. Surgeon, go. Capcom, work, go for undocking. Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins arrived at the moon on Saturday, July 19th. When we did get close and we rolled out and saw it for the first time, it was, uh, it was a revelation. It was gigantic. It, uh, it filled our entire window. The next day, Sunday, July 20th, was landing day. In a lot of anticipation, we finally come to the day, the moment that this is about to commence. Landing on the moon was absolutely the most difficult piece of any Apollo mission, okay? Think about it as a controlled fall out of lunar orbit. The problem is, in this controlled fall out of orbit, you only have enough fuel for one try. Capcom, we're go for landing. Altitude 4200. Go for landing, over. The trajectory had been wrong. We had, they were targeted into this inhospitable place. Then it had to fly over this area at a high forward velocity, then pitch up to slow down so that kill their forward velocity, and then start down like a helicopter. So now we're critical fuel state. And that's why the 60-second call was given, and then the 30-second call. Then I really got nervous was calling out 25 seconds of fuel left. And then 20 seconds of fuel. Oh, jeez. Okay, engine stop. ACA at a descent. Boat control, both auto. Descent engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We copy it down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Uh, the landing to me was a great celebration. The nation was almost euphoric. Well, it, it proved that the United States could uh, accomplish tremendous goals if they worked together as a team. Apollo 11 Commander Neil Armstrong is forever known as the first man. He passed away in 2012, but his small step on the lunar surface continues to inspire. Airmen from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, AP. He came in peace for all mankind. Our knowledge of the universe around us is has increased a thousandfold and more. This is the new ocean and we must sail upon it and we must be a leader on it. And that caught people's imagination. And later we'll speak to some Apollo astronauts live and we'll also hear from Neil Armstrong's son, Mark. Daryl? Looking forward to that. Neil Armstrong's son looks just like him, too, doesn't he? Yes, I love listening to him. Great guy. We've got our own astronauts here, too. Yeah. We're going to talk to Stan Love in just a little bit. Even as we celebrate the historic milestone of Apollo 11, we're working hard to return humans to the moon in the next five years as we plot an eventual course to Mars. We call it the Artemis program, a 21st century successor to Apollo. Artemis was Apollo's twin sister and goddess of the moon in Greek mythology. We'll carry that name with us to the moon again, landing astronauts by 2024 and establishing sustainable lunar exploration by 2028. To get there, we're building a powerful rocket, the Space Launch System, to send astronauts aboard our new Orion spacecraft to the Gateway in lunar orbit. From the Gateway, we'll be able to land astronauts in places we've never been before including the lunar south pole. We'll have a human lander system staged at the gateway, but before then, we'll already be back on the moon with robotic commercial landers carrying science instruments and technology demonstrations to the moon beginning in September of next year. And we'll need a new generation of spacesuits as we send the first woman and the next man to the moon. 
As we do this, we gain more scientific knowledge about the solar system in which we live. And American companies, large and small, are developing advanced technologies to realize these space exploration dreams for NASA. And as with Apollo, many of these technologies will later grow into everyday parts of life here on Earth. And stay tuned to the end of our show. We'll have a fun reveal about Artemis. Now joining us live is astronaut Stan Love, who flew on space shuttle mission STS-122 to the International Space Station, and he's currently working on the development of future human spacecraft. Stan, 12 astronauts walked on the moon between 1969 and 1972. Did Neil Armstrong uh, inspire you in any way at any level? Well, absolutely. I think anybody my age was interested in science or technology or exploration uh, held the Apollo 11 astronauts as heroes. I remember when I was in grade school, six years old, my little tin lunchbox had the astronauts and the Apollo spacecraft on it. So I had that in there from the beginning. Yeah. And I remember uh, coming to work on my very first day as an astronaut, driving in the gate at Johnson Space Center, and thinking, oh my goodness, this is where it happened. This is where we landed people on the moon for the very first time. It was sort of this sense of awe and an incredible sense of honor to be able to join that effort, especially as a crew member. And then some trepidation, really hoping I was up to the task. And indeed you were. In fact, we got some video of you launching in the space shuttle with a camera that had like an inside view. Now, that was an exciting ride. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When they launch or light those solid rocket motors in the shuttle, you know you're going somewhere in a big hurry. It's like two strong guys shaking their, your chair as hard as they can, and uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Now, you're working on future human spacecraft. That's Tell me a, a little bit about that involvement. So I'm working on the cockpit for the Orion spacecraft. That is going to be the backbone, the main transportation device to get people off to the moon, um, to the lunar vicinity, and then bring them back safely to Earth. And I'm working on the displays and the controls that the crew are going to use to see how their systems are doing, guide that vehicle and fly it. Um, so it's up to me and the folks I work with to make sure that the crew is getting all the information they need and that the commands they send out go correctly to the vehicle. Well, that is exciting work. And Stan, thank, thank you, you so much for joining us. You're welcome. All right, send it back over to you, Marie. All right, thanks, Daryl and Stan. And thank you. We'll be hearing more from current and former astronauts throughout this program, including Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins from Apollo 11 and other Apollo astronauts as well. Now let's head over to Houston and Apollo's famous mission control. From the historic Mission Control Center, NASA conducted some of its most legendary space missions. The first U.S. spacewalk, the Apollo moon landings, and even the dawn of the space shuttle era of exploration. In this room from 1965 until 1992, flight controllers monitored every aspect of the mission, power, navigation, communications, and even the health of the astronauts. With all that happened here, it's no wonder this flight control room was designated a National Historic Landmark. But after years of inactivity, the historic room fell into disrepair until a new mission was launched to save it. A restoration effort set out to bring back every detail of the room as it would have been during the time of the Apollo moon landings. This is kind of a crowning achievement that happened during in 1969. And so for us to recreate that and get that feel and to honor that time and that success, that was really important to us. Finding the original wallpaper and then recreating that, finding the original carpet and recreating that, and then just getting the seats restored and put back together. And then just all the little details, you know, what was on the consoles, what was particular to that flight controller, so it's very personalized, so it's very historically accurate. The work has brought the room back to life, capturing a moment in time. For flight director Gene Kranz, the effort goes beyond the switches and monitors. This room has a uh, has an aura to it. The people that have worked here, they've lived there, they've made the decisions there. Each one of these uh, controllers basically left a legacy here. In the restoration, I think that recognizes the work done in mission control by the teams of mission control. I'm Gary Jordan in that historic mission control. And with me is Gene Kranz, one of the flight directors of Apollo 11, who you just heard. He's at the very same console he was at 50 years ago when Eagle landed on the moon. We also have Charlie Duke, the Capcom, the capsule communicator coming right from his console uh, when Apollo 11 landed. 
He was the voice between the teams here in the room and the astronauts of the historic mission, and later walked on the moon himself during Apollo 16. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have you both here. Gary, it's great with to be you, back Gary. with you today. Thank you. Very cool. Charlie, uh, your famous words back to Neil, I believe uh, part of that quote was, you got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're it breathing was true. again. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this was coming right after Neil Armstrong confirmed that the Eagle has landed. How did it feel to hear, the, hear those words from the moon? Well, very exciting, uh, very close. Uh, we were almost out of gas. <laughs> and so to hear the contact engine stop, we, it was a great relief. Tension was really high. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Gene, that conversation followed one of the tensest parts of the entire mission, really the power descent of Eagle down to the surface of the moon. The flight controllers here seem so calm. How did they stay that way and so focused during that tense time? That's a process of training room discipline. Basically, these are uh, consummate professionals at a very early age. They learn the discipline necessary to accomplish difficult tasks. That's right. There was not a lot of celebrating in this room <laughs> right after they landed, right? So. Uh, Charlie, uh, why not? Well, uh, first off, uh, we had to make sure that the lunar module was secure. If you sprung a leak when you touched down or battery dropped off or a lot of things could happen, uh, you had to be ready to lift off. So we stayed, uh, uh, Gene got us all back to uh, attention after a few little smiles and said, uh, oh, we go for T1. And so we had a set time, T1, T2, T3. And uh, I don't remember exactly how long those were, uh, but we were focused on making sure this lunar module was safe and secure and ready to go if we had to lift off. That's right. Gene, the flight controllers in this room were not much older than myself. I'm about 27, which I think is the, about the average age of flight controllers. Tell me about the level of trust that was needed in the team to make that mission a reality. Basically, it's a trust that exists between myself and the team, between my team and the astronaut we got, and with the uh, program office. I think trust is the essential commodity for success in manned spaceflight. And I think one of the things that uh, Charlie mentioned here was the T3 stay, no stay. Yeah. We had to wait two hours to join the celebration with the rest of the world. We were <laughs> on the console doing our job. Two hours after landing, we could celebrate. All right. Now, uh, Charlie, when those, those first steps of, of Neil Armstrong on the moon and those famous words he said, for all mankind, did you get to celebrate immediately, or when did it, when did it actually hit you, the significance of the accomplishment? Well, after uh, we, we were off duty after T3, and we went to a press conference. <laughs> then I, if I remember, we went and celebrated with a few beers at that point. All right. And then I went home and was with my family uh, watching it on TV as he stepped, took those first steps out. All right. And then it hit me about we were on the moon. <laughs> well, I hope we get to have that feeling once again. Um, do. We have Jessica Meir here joining us now. Uh, she's an astronaut, uh, set to launch to the International Space Station here in just a few short months. Uh, she was selected as an astronaut in 2013. And Jessica, you're going through some training right now for a long duration stay aboard the International Space Station, just about six months. And that's actually more time than all the Apollo missions combined. Tell me. What you're going to be doing on the International Space Station, how is that going to help us for our future missions, going back to the moon and on to Mars? So I'll be up there for a six-month mission, as you mentioned, and really the space station is a world-class laboratory right now. It's a U.S. national lab, and of course we are working with all of our international partners as well, the Russian Space Agency, the Canadian, Japanese, and European space agencies. So we are conducting all kinds of scientific investigations and technology demonstrations that are really critical toward our path for future exploration. So just to name a few, for example, of course we need to understand how spaceflight and the microgravity environment affect us and our human our bodies and our physiology so we have decades of research now from all of this scientific research that we've been conducting on the space station and in the programs before we know a lot how to maintain our muscle mass and maintain our bone density we have a few hot topics right now really the the vision our vision and the health of our eyes also what's happening to our blood vessels looking at our carotid arteries and some changes that we're actually seeing in astronauts that are very similar to the process of aging. So we need to really better understand what is happening here to make sure that we can get astronauts safely to their destination and make sure, of course, that we can bring them safely back to Earth. And you'll get to do that firsthand as an astronaut. 
Now, as I know it, actually, Charlie Duke here actually inspired you to become an astronaut in the first place. Yeah, he actually was the very first astronaut <laughs> I ever met. So it is pretty amazing. It's really an incredible experience to be standing in this room with these two people. When I was in high school, Charlie was speaking at the neighboring town. I grew up in a really small town in, in northern Maine, and we did not have a lot of astronauts coming through. I'd never met anybody that worked at NASA or an astronaut. So I went to hear him talk, and I'm sure he doesn't remember this, but um, <laughs> he, I, uh, I did talk to him afterward. He gave me his card. I told him that my dream was to become an astronaut like him. And I wrote him a letter, and I thought, you know, he's so busy, I'm sure he gets lots of these. But he did actually write back to me. And this is the actual letter. I found it when I moved a couple years ago. <laughs> this is the letter that you wrote to me back in 1996 <laughs> when I was a freshman in college. So maybe that'll jog your memory. But thank you so much for doing that. It, it really, really was inspiring, and it does make a difference. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> always to, good to inspire somebody and inspire somebody. Thank you. Wow. It's typewritten. I love that. All right. <laughs> now, uh, uh, Gene, when, when we're thinking about our future missions, you use the phrase tough and competent, thinking about inspiring those next generations. Do you think those same values will apply to the folks that are going to carry us to those yes, next generations? Yes, I think they will, because uh, tough and competent really address the accountability of the mission control team, basically to take the actions necessary to protect the crew and accomplish the mission. Tough meetings that you're forever accountable for what you do, and this was done after the Apollo 1, what we failed to do. Competent, we'll never, in, never again take anything for, for granted. We'll never stop learning. From now on, the teams in mission control will be perfect. Hmm. Now, Charlie, what can astronauts today, like Jessica, do to inspire the next generation? Well, I think what she's uh, 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 her, just her performance and uh, what she's doing and being out there, being able to uh, before the public and uh, and uh, just uh, uh, telling her story. Writing it, a letter. Yeah. It, <laughs> uh, yeah. So. All right. Well, thanks to all three of you for taking the time to be with us here today in the historic Apollo Mission Control in Houston. NASA's Giant Leaps continues at Wapakoneta, Ohio, the hometown of Neil Armstrong. We'll go there in a moment, but first, some thoughts about explorers from a different kind of rocket man. They want adventure, and I really admire those kind of people. They, they're so brave yeah. and intrepid. They're pioneers. And, you know, without Christopher Columbus, Magellan, uh, Marco Polo, we, we wouldn't, you know, Sir Francis Drake, all those kind of people, um, the world wouldn't be what it is today. And welcome to Wapakoneta, Ohio, which is proud to be the hometown of Neil Armstrong. I'm Ty Bateman, an anchor with Hometown Stations in Lima, Ohio. And we are located at the Armstrong Air and Space Museum, which is about an hour north of Dayton, Ohio. Now, that, of course, is the home of the Wright brothers who invented power flight more than 115 years ago. Now, Ohio is also the home of NASA's Glenn Research Center, named for another space pioneer, John Glenn. And we are in the midst of the Summer Moon Festival, which is an annual celebration of the Apollo moon landing. And right now, we actually have one of our 25 astronauts who hail from Ohio and is also a native of Cleveland and a veteran of four space shuttle missions. Don Thomas, thank you so much for being with us. Hi, it's great to be here today. Well, let's get right into it, Don. You, of course, have been inspired by so many astronauts, but how did Neil Armstrong and the other Apollo astronauts inspire you? You know, it was the first astronauts launching in 1961 that first inspired me to be an astronaut. I watched their launch on a small TV, and I just said, I want to do that. And so all the early astronauts, John Glenn, Ed White, who did the first spacewalk, and then Neil Armstrong, they were huge influences on my career. Well, John, that's awesome. So you watched the Apollo 11 launch on TV, and I understand that you also invited Neil Armstrong to watch one of your launches. I did. You know, we're allowed to invite a few VIPs to our launches, and I wrote Neil Armstrong a letter, said I was one of the Ohio astronauts. I told him he was one of my heroes as a young boy. And I invited him to come to the launch. He wrote back, said, I'll be there. And I was like, wow, Neil Armstrong's coming to my launch. I was so excited. And it was the day before launch, I got a call from NASA management down at the Kennedy Space Center. And they said, Mr. Armstrong wanted to meet with me. So my wife and I, Neil Armstrong and his wife, Carol, we got to spend about an hour together in the crew quarters, just talking and I'm showing him around. 
And at the end of our hour, I had a great moment. I was shaking his hand saying, thank you for being here. I really appreciate you coming to the launch. And I asked him, how long are you staying in town for? Meaning, how long are you going to be in Florida for? And he looked me right back in the eye. He said, how long are you in town for? Meaning, I'm going to stay here until you launch. And we launched right on time the next day. And it was a, a thrill of my life to have him there for the launch. Incredible. Don, thank you for those memories. Well, let's take a look back at Neil Armstrong, the man. Neil Armstrong was born in his grandparents' farmhouse on the outskirts of La Pagnetta. We sat down with Neil's brother and sister and asked them to share some personal memories of their famous brother. He was very good at telling jokes. And in the accent. In the accent, especially Scottish, Scottish accent, right. Oh, my. And a little bit of German sometimes also, but depending on what story he was telling. But he was good at it because he tells a story and he has this, you know, just a little bit of smile on his face. And then everybody laughs and he laughs and he laughs because he thought it was funny too. <laughs> the legacy hasn't yet been determined. In science, uh, the doors are still so wide open. And I really feel like that it, it helped uh, inspire the technical aspect of this country. You know, we, we had many big technical breakthroughs with the program, NASA program, and, and uh, now you can see that continuing. I think my dad would be very pleased with where we are now because we're on the cusp of another age of exploration taking those next steps going back to the moon because that's the place where we can learn the things that we need when we go beyond the moon. if we can remind everyone of how the world was uplifted by the apollo program and by these endeavors i think that we have a good chance of staying the course and continuing that exploration forward. Being an astronaut was our father's way of life. That was dad's job and, and we were all supportive and excited. The astronauts, the guys when they were up there, they, they, the last thing they wanted to do was to worry about what was happening at home. I think the wives just tried to uh, make sure that the family wasn't one of those things that they, they had in their checklist of, of things to, to be concerned about. The Apollo program inspired a generation to want to be better, to want to work hard and apply themselves and pursue their dreams because Apollo made it clear that dreams were possible. And I think that made the world a better place. Now, as you drive through town or stroll down the sidewalks, you'll see just how over the moon everyone is in Wapakoneta. More than a dozen restaurants are offering special moon-themed items, such as cinnamon pancakes and a Buckeye on the moon Sunday. It seems every shop is selling first on the moon merchandise, souvenirs, and memorabilia. And history is all around us. It's a part of history that I want to be able to say that I helped to preserve. Uh, it's not so much, you know, what was it like when he lived here, for me personally, but to be able to preserve part of history and keep it intact for future generations. And with me now is Dante Centuri with the Armstrong Museum. Dante, welcome. So let's get straight into it. Tell me a little bit about what people can experience if they were to visit the museum. Sure. Well, the Armstrong Air and Space Museum opened three years to the day after Apollo 11 landed in 1972. We have artifacts from Neil Armstrong's early life and career, the airplane he learned to fly in right next to the Gemini 8 capsule that he flew his first space flight in, as well as the uh, Apollo backup suit from Apollo 11, the actual suit. Uh, that was part of his mission. And uh, to top it all off, we also have a moon rock collected from Apollo 11, uh, collected by Neil Armstrong himself on that mission. Awesome. Now, how does it feel for you to be entrusted with preserving uh, the legacy of an American hero? Well, it's, it's very humbling, but uh, the, the best part here is there's a tremendous team. There's staff, the, the board, everyone supports in the community is such a wonderful support uh, for the museum and, and Neil Armstrong's uh, legacy right here in Wapakoneta. 
All right, Dante, thank you so much. Thank you. And now I would like to welcome Sunny Williams, another Ohio astronaut. She's a native of Euclid and a veteran of two space station missions, including seven spacewalks. Welcome, Sunny. Hi, Ty. It's great to be here in Wapakoneta. Yes, it's awesome here. So how does research aboard the International Space Station help us expand exploration, not only on the moon, but also um, later getting to Mars? Right, so um, I've had the luxury of being on the space station two times, and I've seen we, we're doing all sorts of experiments on propulsion systems, life support systems, even spacesuit systems that will help us on our next endeavors back to the moon and even further out of low Earth orbit beyond and to Mars. Well, you're also set to return to space on one of NASA's upcoming commercial crew missions. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm scheduled to be on one of the first Boeing Starliner flights to go to the International Space Station, along with uh, SpaceX's Dragon 2, which will take some of our colleagues up to the space station. And this contract to allow these other companies to be able to take people up will allow NASA to refocus on getting out of low Earth orbit, back to the moon, and potentially onto Mars for the next generation. So all of the work that's going on the International Space Station, including uh, these commercial companies, will help us, enable us to go further. So are you scheduled to conduct any more spacewalks, Sunny? Well, you know, the space station is about 20 years old. It's like an old house, and uh, things need to be fixed, and we're doing new things to add on to it, so it's, it's pretty probable, and I'll be looking forward to doing that. All right, Sunny, thank you for that. And thanks from here in Wapakoneta. Let's head to D.C. Thanks, Ty. NASA and the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum are hosting this celebration of the 50th anniversary of the first man on the moon. We have a lot going on here, right here on the mall. There are tents highlighting both the Apollo program and today's Moon to Mars plans. Lego has an incredible Apollo 11 display that took days to build. And Snoopy is here. Of course, Snoopy was the name of the lunar module on Apollo 10, the dress rehearsal for the actual moon landing. And as you've probably seen, people on the National Mall have been wowed this week by a high-def projection of the Saturn V rocket on the Washington Monument. We'll actually be able to see a recreation of a launch here tonight and tomorrow night. It really just gives you a sense of the scale of that massive rocket. Apollo 11 was the culmination of an incredible national effort that started with a promise from President John F. Kennedy to go to the moon within the decade. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. At the direction of the President of the United States, it is the stated policy of this administration and the United States of America to return American astronauts to the moon within the next five years. So now NASA is facing another bold challenge, and this time the ultimate goal isn't just JFK's goal of land on the moon and return safely to Earth, but establishing a sustainable presence on the moon and eventually heading off to Mars. So we are going to be doing some interesting science when we're there, and that's one of the really exciting things. For example, we will be able to look in the giant craters, these deep craters in the southern pole region of the moon. There are places down there that never get sunlight, and we think there's water there, so we're going to be going and checking that out. Now, let's go to Adam Savage with astronaut Randy Bresnik inside the Air and Space Museum. Uh, Randy, uh, you've flown the shuttle. You've flown on the shuttle and spent time on the International Space Station. I I'm curious, the first time you opened the hatch to get on the ISS, given all the training you had already had up until that point, what, what surprised you and what felt exactly like you expected? The thing that surprised me the most was uh, the fact that there were some crew members on the space station that I hadn't met yet, I hadn't trained with. You know, they, they were up there doing a long-duration mission. And so it turns out I have a call sign coming from the Marine Corps being the fighter pilot. It's Conrad. And so um, it was interesting when we got on the space station, you know, these, these Russian crew members who I hadn't met who had been, you know, adversaries you know, of my F-18 in the Marine Corps, they, uh, they hear my crew member go, hey, Conrad, come over here. 
Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> a little, little shocked you know, when they heard uh, you know, that somebody used that uh, in such a you know, normal term coming from my crew members. But what was neat about it was uh, even those these were folks that I hadn't met and all that, we float across the hatch and it was big bear hugs as if we were like long lost family members who hadn't seen each other you know in a, in a few weeks and we really? were just catching up and, and it really struck me because I only had you know two and a half days three days on orbit at that point that here we are now the crew from Atlantis the crew that was on station twelve human beings in this magnificent orbiting laboratory two hundred fifty miles above the earth going seventeen thousand miles an hour and we were that, that was it that was all of humanity in orbit right. you know, we were there doing the shared mission. And, and just how that made us all just part of this one thing. It didn't matter what language we spoke or where we came from. Here we were, just one family on orbit doing the work. Amazing. I, now, you, you, you've, uh, we were talking before, and you said you spent 32 hours in space during spacewalks. Um, what do you get used to, and what always surprises you about getting into and going outside the spacecraft? We'll start with that part first, because I don't think whether it's your first, your fifth, or you know, like Mike L.A. Your, your, or Jerry Ross, you know, your ninth or tenth. Um, when you open that hatch, which, which in the space station opens down, right? <laughs> you know, you open it up, you're inside this you know, metal cocoon the whole time, and that, that's, you know, there's some safety in that. You open the hatch, and it is 250 miles or 400 kilometers straight down. And so for anybody, you know, has a fear of heights, you know, it's, it's daunting. But for anybody who doesn't have a fear of heights, if you go to the edge of a tall building, and you stay on the edge and put your toes on lean over, your body tells you, get, get back, you know, lean back. You have that intense, really? intense feeling except type times a thousand because you're 250 miles up. Um, but you go back to relying on your training. You know, you go back to, okay, I know I'm not going to fall. I'm going to float. Even though I'm in this massive, you know, my own personal space suit going out the door, I know that if I go out there and let go, I'm not going to fall. But your brain, your whole life has told you that you would. So you go out there, and just like we practiced in the neutral buoyancy laboratory, we're going for our swimming pool down in, in Houston where we have the space station. You just go out and do your training. You reach out, you put your hand on the handrails, you, do, you turn your body the way you normally do. You put out your waist tether, you put out your you know, uh, body restraint tether, and you go ahead and you know, do what you train for. It's just the view, instead of being you know, uh, concrete 40 feet below you in the bottom of the pool, you now have the earth going by at five miles a second to distract you while you're out there. Oh my the goodness. I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about how Apollo era technology led to the technology that got you into space. Well, they were the basis for everything. I mean, that it's, I, I am in awe, just like you and everybody else, especially today, it takes time to remember and commemorate this amazing, you know, historic achievement and what they did. I mean, we had not, but had but 15 minutes in space when President Kennedy challenged us to go to the moon. And within a decade, we had, you know, Neil, Buzz, and Mike Collins there on Apollo 9, uh, pardon, sorry, Apollo 11. That is astounding. And everything we've done since then has been based on those amazing investments in technology and the capabilities to live and work in space that, that have been since there. And, and the suit that I was on space with walks is the you know, grandson of the suit that was on Apollo on the lunar surface. Uh, well, uh, famously, uh, Buzz Aldrin uh, was not able to be here, but we do have a Buzz tribute video, which we can run. Uh, let's run this and see a little bit about Buzz. We've come to the conclusion that this has been far more than three men on a voyage to the moon. This stands as a symbol of the insatiable curiosity of all mankind to explore the unknown. We accepted the challenge of going to the moon. The acceptance of this challenge was inevitable. Today, I feel we're fully capable of accepting expanded roles in the exploration of space. Randy, are you excited about the future of space travel? Absolutely. In the 15 years I've been at NASA, there's never been a more exciting time. We have got, you know, two commercial vehicles that are getting ready to launch up and put people on the space station. We've had 19 years of continuous presence on the space station. We've got, you know, Artemis getting set up where we have got the Orion space vehicle aboard the world's largest rocket, the SLS, and then we're going to start launching humans on, in two years Amazing. You know, around the moon again. And it never been a better time for it. Randy, thank you so much for joining us here Welcome. today. I really appreciate it. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were almost stuck on the surface of the moon. As the crew was coming back in, they had to take off those large spacesuits. And they were pretty big, and the lunar module's pretty small. In the process of doing that, 
Buzz bumped up against the engine arm switch, the switch that was critical to turning on the rocket motor that would allow them to launch off the surface of the moon. The switch broke off. And so when the time came to flip that switch to get ready to, to launch off the surface of the moon, there was no switch there to flip. What's he going to do? Buzz was thinking fast. He pulls out a felt tip pen and jams it in to that spot and is able to use the felt tip pen as a pseudo switch. And they successfully get off the surface of the moon and come home. My grandfather, President Kennedy, challenged Americans to send a man to the moon, not because it would be easy, but because it would be so hard. NASA and our entire nation answered his call to action and made that dream a reality. Today, we salute the men and women of the Apollo generation and look forward to the future and the new frontiers yet to be discovered. And looking now over the water, we're coming up on Launch Complex 39 here at Kennedy Space Center. The two pads that you see in the distance there, pad B is where we're going to launch the first woman to the moon and the next man to the moon, right there. Yeah, well, that's actually pad A, which is um, SpaceX's pad, which is currently, of course, launching uh, their rockets, the Heavy and the Falcon. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a beautiful shot as we fly over the Banana River and into that launch complex there, 39A, where, of course, many a historic launch happened here yes. at the Kennedy Space Center. And we continue to celebrate as well. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. And the mood here is just euphoric. I mean, so many people in awe of this nation's amazing achievement 50 years ago. Indeed. And it's a warm day here in Florida. You can see the clouds bubbling up over 39A on the crew access arm that extends out from that pad. Um, it's not quite as hot as the rest of the country, though, because there's a heat wave yeah. that's currently uh, got the grip of the nation, most of the nation. Uh, but we're still pretty toasty here in Florida. And in fact, Marie, we're celebrating Moonfest at this time, uh, yeah. a celebration, of course, of the 50th anniversary of Apollo, where our own employees got to go out and to the gantry, eat moon pies and yeah. dress up in 1960s attire. Yeah. You know, I think they're already out of the moon pie, so we didn't. We, I don't know if anybody saved any for us, but no, I don't think they did. But uh, they did. They gave them away for free, and that was a that was a nice gesture on yeah. this on this historic day. Yes, absolutely. And as we continue to celebrate the historic achievement of 1969, we look ahead to traveling back to the moon and on to Mars. Just as in the Apollo area era, we need many elements to get there, from rockets and spacecraft to astronaut life support and more, all in support of science and exploration on the surface. There's a lot of work already being done to make that happen with our Artemis program. We're preparing to launch our new space launch system rocket and the Orion, which is an entirely new space capsule. We're also developing a gateway at the moon. We'll have new robotic and human landers and new spacesuits. All this is happening while advances in science and technology will expand our knowledge and enrich life back here on Earth. And there's the, that list there of those items I was just telling you about. And we'll be telling you more about each of those elements you see there on your screen throughout the show today. And it's important, each one of those elements, as they come together to form this program of the future. Artemis is a very complex program. But we want to go back to the moon sustainably and permanently. Um, to, in order to test our technology to go on to Mars. So it's all very key. Absolutely. And we're going to see coming up after this show today, starting at 3 o'clock, we've got a show called our STEM show that's going to show you how students are breaking down a mission to the moon. That's going to be a great show. Make sure you stay tuned for that at 3 o'clock right here on NASA TV. Forward to the moon, our STEM show. It's going to be a good one. Did you know that one of the most valuable samples brought back from the moon by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin almost didn't happen? Neil and Buzz had a series of containers that they put their lunar samples in, and they mostly went around and picked up rocks. But right near the end of their walk on the moon, as Neil was preparing the boxes to ship back up to the 
the lunar module for returning back to Earth. Neil looked into one of the boxes and realized that there wasn't a whole lot in there. And he thought, that's not right. We should be bringing more back. So he took the box and scooped it along the surface and pulled a whole bunch of dirt from the surface of the moon into the box. It turns out that that dirt, the lunar regolith, was really important to helping us understand uh, the solar wind and other properties of the moon. And that was information that we didn't get from rocks. So that impromptu sample collection is actually one of the most valuable samples that we brought back from the moon on Apollo 11. Welcome to the U.S. Space Did you know that the Apollo Center guidance computer? Alabama. This is, I am Nicarla Friend, and this is the official visitor center for NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Now, Marshall has been designing and building the rockets that send astronauts into space since 1960. In fact, this machine here is an authentic F-1 engine that powered the Saturn V, the vehicle that launched the Apollo missions. The Saturn V's chief architect was Marshall's first director, Warner Von Braun, and throughout the 1950s, Von Braun promoted space travel. He also helped spur much of the technology that first took Americans into space. And now America is ready for the next wave of human exploration, NASA's Artemis mission, which will take Americans to the moon and will set the stage for putting humans on Mars. Marshall is again working on the rocket to get them there, the Space Launch System, or SLS. At Marshall, we are proud of our heritage of fire and smoke. Here's a look. Joining me now is astronaut Rex Walheim. Now, he flew three different space shuttle missions, including the very last one, STS-135. Hi, Rex. How are you? Great, Carl. It's great to be here. Now, you didn't get a chance to ride on a Saturn V, but tell us what it's like as an astronaut to be in a rocket at, at liftoff. Well, probably the most memorable one is your first time, and you're loaded into the rocket about a couple hours before launch, and you're strapped in, and it feels like you're sitting in this very high-rise building, solid as a rock. And then about six seconds before launch, the main engines start up, and even though you're still bolted to the pad, it shakes like it's coming apart. It's really amazing. And then if the engines operate great for six seconds, then the solid rocket booster is light, and then you feel that jolt, and you lift off, and it's an incredible ride from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. That sounds incredible. Now, as we look back on Apollo 11, what are your thoughts as an astronaut about reestablishing a human presence beyond Earth orbit? Well, I think it's so important because the Apollo program, they went to the frontier, to the moon, farther than any humans have ever traveled in history. And we need to get back there so we can learn how to do that again because it's very difficult to get there and we haven't done it in decades. We want to go there, learn how to do it, and then go beyond and go to Mars. Now, we actually have um, a social media question. Um, one Manish on Twitter asks, what is NASA's plan for future astronaut programs? Well, first, future astronaut programs will be similar to the ones today. We'll select the best and the brightest, the folks from all across the country, the most diverse backgrounds we can get, the people who've shown that they can excel in various different types of functions. And we'll bring them all down to the Johnson Space Center and try to interview to who's going to work the best. And it'll be very similar to now, except there's going to be a different dimension with the, uh, the autonomy that we're going to need and the, more of the expeditionary behavior where, where people are going farther than we've ever gone before. And they'll be far from, so far from Earth that it'll take minutes and minutes for just communications to go back and forth. So they'll have to be comfortable operating by themselves. But uh, for the most part, it will be very similar to the way we pick astronauts today. Thanks, Rex. You know, today thousands of NASA employees, contractors, and suppliers are working in all 50 states to turn our plans into reality. The Apollo program also was a nationwide effort on a giant scale with so many unsung heroes behind the famous names and faces. And many Apollo-era veterans are right here in Huntsville. Let's hear from a few of them about that era. Uh, most of us were just out of college, didn't have much of a uh, experience. 
But here's a challenge. We're going to do something in 10 months that's never been done before. I mean, you never went home with your desk cleaned off. It was just so much to do. We were just all heads down trying to get ready. And, you know, it didn't matter that I was a co-op. It didn't matter that I was 19 years old. I didn't mind working 80 bucks, 80 hours a week because we knew we were going to do something different. You didn't go home until you had finished your work. That, that was pretty standard in those days. Late to bed, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. And we were committed to make it happen. The thing about the moon that I thought was peculiar was when the sun was almost overhead and it was noon down below, the moon appeared to be a warm and a friendly place. Near dawn or dusk, the place looked distinctly unfriendly. What a great tribute to Apollo 11 Command Module Pilot, Mike Collins, who joins me now live along with astronaut candidate, Zena Gardman. Welcome. Thank you, Karen. And, Thank you. And Zena, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from both of you. Yes, likewise. It's good to have you here. Now, Mike, uh, people may not know that after your NASA career, you were the first director of this very Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, taking charge while the building was under construction and then being here when the doors first opened in 1976. It's been one of the most visited tourist sites in Washington ever since. So, Director Collins, oh, wow. welcome back. Thank you. It's so nice to be back. Uh, the Smithsonian's always been one of my most favorite buildings anywhere in the world and uh, I used to go to the <clears throat> Museum of Natural History and when I was perhaps 10 years old I would watch snails now they had these were not live snails they were s snail shells but they had like 37 of them all in a row and I used to for some reason I was totally fascinated by that display I used to count them and figure out why they were big and little and what colors they were and all of those things. So that's my upbringing is Smithsonian. And uh, Air and Space, uh, of course, came much later. And uh, I had a lot of help uh, with people like Barry Goldwater, who was a, a senator on the right committees, who helped me get money to get the $40 million of mass that we needed to dig the hole and bring the building up. It was an interesting time. Well, it's a wonderful place to be now. Uh, let's take us back in time a little bit. You were up orbiting the moon during that Apollo 11. You went around some 30 times alone uh, over about 24 hours. Take us there. Tell us what you were feeling and what that was like. You know, I was amazed. I was always asked, weren't you the loneliest person in the whole lonely universe when you were in that lonely command module all by your lonely self going around the lonely moon? <laughs> weren't you lonely? No, no, I was happy. I was at home. Uh, this was my my little place, the Columbia, the command module was, uh, well, I had hot coffee, uh, I had music if I wanted it. If I had some problem or question, I just got on the, on the radio with Mission Control and they were always very helpful. They even tried to talk to me when I was by myself behind the moon. But ha ha, they were, couldn't get to me in that situation. So down on the ground was Neil Armstrong, who obviously is a larger than life historic figure. Tell us what you'd like people to remember about him as a crewmate and as a commander. Um, about the uh, crewmate, oh, 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 Neil, Neil. as the crewmate. Neil, real, young, Neil, real person. Well, Neil, he, Neil was, uh, he was an uh, all-American person. And, uh, in many ways, Neil was very intelligent. He, um, he had uh, interests in science uh, on both sides of the kind of work that NASA does. Uh, he, um, he, was, he was modest. He didn't like the uh, spotlight on him, but when he was caught in its glare, he knew exactly what to say. Uh, after the flight of Apollo 11, uh, we were uh, 
very fortunate to have an around the world trip and Neil was our uh, spokesperson and um, he just did a masterful job. He'd done his homework everywhere we went. He, he knew the background of the country. He knew what to say to the local people. By the time he finished one of his short five, ten minute speeches, uh, half of the audience was ready to climb on board Columbia and go with us. He was just <laughs> masterful. That's great. And, and, uh, All right, we are, we have some people hoping to ask questions to Zena and to Michael Collins. Social media, though I just realized we may not have the access to the social media questions, so I am instead going to turn to a question to Zena, who I had been wanting to ask a question of as well. Obviously, Michael, when you qualified uh, to become an astronaut, you were a pilot, and Zena had took a very different path uh, into this. So tell us a little bit about your path here. Uh, my background's actually in microbiology. I studied biology in college. Uh, my thesis was in poetry, believe it or not. And then I did research in marine microbiology for my master's degree. Um, but to me, one of the most exciting parts of being uh, in the space program now is just how different a background everyone's come from. We are test pilots. We're also microbiologists. We are geologists. We're submariners. It's a really interesting and diverse group to get to work with. And so we are still taking social media questions. We're sorry we can't answer them right here and now, but certainly we'll continue to take them throughout uh, throughout the show. Uh, Zena, give us your perspective on Apollo 11. What what is the legacy of Apollo 11? Actually, I'll toss that to both of you. Tell us about your perspective on the uh, the legacy of Apollo 11. Sure, it's it's a part of the world that I grew up in. I, you know, I I never knew a world before men had left this planet, and uh, so I have to ask the people who lived through that themselves what that means to them, and they can tell me where they were when they saw that happen. They can tell me the exact chair they were sitting in. It was just this monumental, pivotal moment in human history, and so to me, that's just it. It's so touching to know that that's part of the world that I'm in now, and it's this hugely inspiring challenge to my generation. What will be our Apollo? What will be this thing that uh, people around the world will feel a part of? A little bit about the legacy? I, I, I'm not big on legacies. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think maybe 50 years is not enough time to give you proper spacing for it, uh, but I was really taken by uh, something Dina said with her, her um, minor is in poetry. Oh, I love that idea. I, <laughs> That's great. I go to MIT from time to time and talk to the students up there. And uh, of course the great push in this country today, and rightfully so, is science, technology, engineering, math, STEM. And I say, now nah, that's not a complete education. You've got to put poetry in there. <laughs> we are going to now toss back to the mall to Adam Savage, who has a message not about poetry, but for those people who still don't think about. we landed on the moon. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Amazingly, there are still people who choose not to believe that we went to the moon, even though to perpetrate such a hoax would have taken far more energy than actually just going to the moon. And on Mythbusters, early in our tenure, my co-hosts, Jamie, Carrie, Grant, and Tori, and I busted this conspiracy theory in pretty much every way we could have possibly tested it. We built miniature models, we rode the vomit comet, we wore spacesuits, we tried everything. And in fact, our episode is used by moon landing deniers to bolster their argument. They thought that our miniature model of the moonscape looked so good, it helped convince them that the moon landing might have been faked by Stanley Kubrick at some secret soundstage in the desert, which is total bunkum. And when I am confronted with that sort of willful ignorance, well, I don't have any answer. Uh, but apparently Tahira has a, uh, a question from the crowd out on the mall. Tahira? Hi. I'm Tahira, and I'm out here on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. It is a beautiful day out here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. Right now, I'm following the conversation on social media, and Twitter user David says, it would have been harder to fake it than to do it in regards to the Apollo 11 moon landing. Adam, you broke it down on Mythbusters. What do you think? Oh. Without a doubt, one of the great pleasures of my life, Tahira, is that I get to talk to people at NASA and meet astronauts and come to places like the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. The fact is, is the pride that all of the incredible men and women and engineers and scientists 
who executed this incredible feat and continue to execute it on a daily basis. That pride is based in reality, not in fantasy. And it is my honor to be able to meet and talk to these folks. Uh, when NASA's giant leap continues, it'll be with fire and smoke from Alabama. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Roger, we got a roll for Tower clear. Roger, roll. Welcome back to Wapakoneta and the Armstrong Air and Space Museum. I'm Ty Bateman, an anchor with Hometown Stations in Lima, Ohio. And I'm here with a team from the Glenn Research Center that not only developed liquid hydrogen as rocket fuel, but also developed uh, electric propulsion and the team is also working on a new generation electric propulsion system that will power our gateway an outpost for astronauts in lunar orbit that will give access to the surface and joining me now from the Glenn Research Center is Mike Barrett hello Mike hi Ty and how does electric propulsion work and how is it different from chemical rockets well, traditional chemical propulsion burns a fuel, uh, and that generates a high temperature gas that gets pushed out of the spacecraft in one direction, and that propels the spacecraft in the opposite direction. Electric propulsion, instead of burning a fuel, uses electricity to charge or ionize a gas, and then that is accelerated out of the spacecraft, uh, and that provides that propulsive push. Now, where does the power come from? Well, for solar electric propulsion, the power comes from the sun. Uh, we use solar panels to convert sunlight into electricity, and then that electricity is used to power both the spacecraft and the electric propulsion system. So how will solar electric propulsion help NASA get to the moon and eventually to Mars? Well, since solar electric propulsion doesn't have to take all that fuel with it, uh, and it uses the sunlight for energy, then that spacecraft, instead of having to take all that fuel, can take things like oxygen, water, communications equipment, science experiments, anything else the astronauts need to complete the mission. That makes the build and design of that spacecraft a lot easier, and the efficiency of the electric propulsion helps us make the mission more achievable. Mike, very exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you. And NASA's giant leaps continue down at Space Center Houston. But first, as you see from our show today, NASA really is everywhere with technological and economic impact all across the country. Innovation for exploration has an impact on our daily lives, just as it did in the Apollo era. Down. Two twenty feet. Fifteen forward. All engine running. Lift off. We have a lift off on Apollo eleven. Dave, an extraordinary television picture here. This nation should commit itself to achieving the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. I think landing on the moon changed the sky from a barrier into a doorway. 
it turned the sort of this, the backdrop of all of human history, the sky, into an invitation. I would give anything to remember that moment. My mom promises I saw it, but I, I, I don't remember a thing. Might be one of the reasons why I'm a little obsessed with the moon landing. I have, I have the special New York Times edition when they were on their way to the moon, July 17th. The models of the moon, that's, where are we? That's, that's, there it is. That's Sea of Tranquility. That's, that's where they landed, right there. Any thoughts on traveling to Mars? Can I bring my family with me? Yes. Yes, I would go to Mars. They got water there and everything. And methane, what more do you want? Hi, we're at Johnson Space Center's official visitor center, joined by President and CEO of Space Center Houston, William Harris. Thanks, Brandy. Welcome to Space Center Houston. We're a dynamic learning destination where we share what NASA's doing every day, where we inspire people of all ages through the wonders of space exploration. Thanks, William, for hosting this segment for us. And we are joined here today by Apollo 7 astronaut Walt Cunningham. Walt uh, was on the first manned uh, command uh, the manned mission of Apollo, and uh, gave us the first live views of astronauts from space, as well as performing some critical checkouts of the command module. Thanks for joining us, Walt. It is really a pleasure to be with you people here after all of these years. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Tell us a little bit what it was like living and working on that command module for 11 days. Well, in retrospect, that, uh, that 11 days was uh, probably the best 11 days of my life. Uh, we had worked, actually I had worked five years to get up to that. It was three different scheduled flights and overcoming various obstacles. And to this day, that's still the longest, most ambitious, most successful first test flight of any new flying machine ever. So I, I feel very fortunate to have been there. Well, we are fortunate to have you here with us. Having had the longest, most successful flight test of a new spacecraft, do you have any advice for the astronauts who are going to be going up on those first missions for Orion and Artemis? Well, I probably would have some advice, but I, I don't believe that the astronauts have as much authority uh, in, in preparing for these things today as we did 50 years ago. Uh, that means a lot, of, a lot of things have been perfected. At the same time, the society has changed, and the astronauts are not driving everything like we used to get away with. Gotcha. And as you can see, there's a lot of excitement here about the uh, about the Apollo anniversary. That's what you're hearing in the background. But also here with Walt and I, we have Laura Kearney, who is uh, one of the people in charge of some of the new technology we're developing to send people uh, to the moon. Laura is the deputy program manager of Gateway. So that is uh, what a key part of getting um, astronauts to the moon. It will be in lunar orbit. So tell us a little bit about what that is, Laura. Sure. Uh, the Gateway is going to be an orbiting platform, basically, that circles the moon. Um, and it will provide basically an aggregation point where lunar landers can, can go from the Earth to the Gateway, and they can aggregate there, and we'll be able to fly missions to and from the moon. Uh, the great thing about the Gateway is it's going to give us access to the entire surface of the moon. How will it be different from the International Space Station? It will be different in a few ways. Uh, for one thing, it's going to be much smaller than the International Space Station. Um, the space station is, is basically the size of a football field, roughly. Uh, the gateway is going to be much smaller, maybe a tenth of the size, so just a fraction. Um, we also, where the space station is inhabited 24-7, um, 365, the gateway will only have people on it when Orion is visiting. So one, to start out, it'll be about once a year, maybe 30 days at a time. Um, so our spacecraft is going to have to be a lot more autonomous than today's space station. And then, of course, the obvious, we're going to be much farther away. <laughs> and this is a pretty new program for us. So where are we in the development of Gateway? You know, we are really making a lot of progress really fast. Uh, the first elements that make up what we're calling phase one of the Gateway uh, should all be in place in order for us to make and support that 2024 boots on the moon mandate that we have. So our first element is the power and propulsion module and it should launch in 2022. We just announced the contractor that's gonna help us build that module, Maxar Technologies. Uh, so they are well on their way. 
Uh, the second module that we put up will be a habitation module. It will dock with that power and propulsion element. And uh, we are very, very close to getting that module on contract and on its way here in probably the next month or two. And then the third element that will be part of that first 2024 phase one is our logistics module. And we ought to have it on contract uh, by the end of this calendar year. So a lot of progress happening really fast. Yeah, lots of balls moving now. So Walt, is there anything that, you know, hearing about Gateway, you wish you had on Apollo 7 or that having had 11 days in space on Apollo 7 that you would recommend having on the Gateway? <clears throat> well, personally, I find it very difficult to uh, compare uh, things today and what they were then 50 years ago. Uh, it's because the organizations become more organized. Uh, many of the problems have been, I won't say solved, but are like 98, 99 percent compared to uh, 50 percent. But I, I do see a difference in attitude in exploring space today from what it was back uh, 50 years ago when everybody was a fighter pilot, test pilot, and we saw it basically as an opportunity to stick our necks out sure. a, a little to do it. And what's amazing uh, for me when I look at that is here we are 50 years later, and I never in my life could have uh, projected this amount of interest and uh, uh, association with what we were doing back then. And also at the same time, since it's a, a civilian operation, it uh, wasn't military. We had all military trained fighter pilots. But what's going to happen is 100 years from now, 200, 500 years from now, there's only going to be probably one thing they remember about the 20th century. And that's that man went to the moon. And uh, Neil Armstrong, he's going to be going down in history. For, for we also doing. appreciate your role in helping us get to where we are today, and we're, we're thankful that you're celebrating with us. <laughs> well, I, I feel very fortunate. I feel more fortunate today because what I was taking for granted back on Apollo 7, which to this day is still the longest, most ambitious, most successful first test flight, back in those days, it was a challenging job to do. We were committed to it. We we're going to do whatever was necessary to make that a success. And now, 50 years later, I look at it in perspective with our overall accomplishment on Apollo. And frankly, I am proud to have played one small step in that with Apollo 7. Well, thank you so much. We are looking forward to also having some big milestones to celebrate in the upcoming uh, years. The big part of that and getting people back onto the moon is going to be gateway. It's going to be cutting edge technology. And that's saying something since we had cutting edge technology 50 years ago. You probably know that the spacecraft that got us to the moon was incredibly complicated. But do you realize that there were 6.1 million parts in the Saturn V launch vehicle and the Apollo spacecraft that had to be assembled and they all had to work correctly for us to get to the moon in July 1969. And welcome back to the Saturn V Center at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. A look at the lunar module. It was supposed to be for Apollo 15, but actually never flew once they decided they were gonna take moon rovers up to the moon. But they say it works and it could have gone to the moon if we needed it. Yeah, and it's 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 one thing to see it, you know, the pictures of it are, are magnificent on camera, but when you're up close and personal right next to it, you really see, you know, all those little details and it's just amazing that we what we were able to accomplish together as a nation. You're absolutely right. And back here at the Kennedy Space Center, if you're just joining us, we are, of course, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo and looking forward to our plans for the next giant leap to the moon and on to Mars. And a reminder that we're taking your questions online using the hashtag Apollo 50th and that we'll have a fun reveal coming up a little later about our Artemis program at the end of the show. A fun reveal? Yes. Can you tell me now? Well, no, then it wouldn't be a reveal <laughs> at the end of the show. you got to wait. Okay. All right, I'm going to wait. <laughs> Well, if you want to follow us, you can just join us right now online and explore our subscription right there at nasa.gov forward slash subscribe. And we'll keep you updated with our newsletter for weekly updates as we go forward to the moon and on to Mars. Subscribe again at nasa.gov forward slash subscribe. 
Now, keep in mind, we didn't just develop technology in the Apollo years. You're looking at the gantry right now at Launch Complex 39, where folks like to gather to watch the launches from pad A and B there. Oh, and cool. we've got uh, a special live guest out there, one of the last two people to walk on the moon. And we've got someone out there to talk to him, Amanda Griffin. Amanda, I don't know if you're if you're out there. She's I'm not sure which level are you on out there? <laughs> I'm at the tippy top. It's, it's a beautiful day, but it is breezy up here. So hopefully you can uh, get us loud and clear here. So behind us is pad 39A. Currently it is being used for missions to the space station and beyond by commercial entities. But 50 years ago, the first men to walk on the moon launched from there. Just a few years later, Apollo 17 launched the last men who walked on the moon, and one of them was Dr. Harrison Smith. Dr. Smith, thanks so much for being with us today. It's great to be with you. I sort of miss seeing a Saturn V out there. Though. I know, but hopefully soon you'll see a, an SLS, well, one we, pad we over. Hope. I'll tell you, the Kinder Space Center is doing a remarkable job getting ready for that. We're excited. So can you tell us, you were NASA's first astronaut scientist. Why was it so important that you were on that mission on Apollo 17? Well, by the uh, time uh, Neil Armstrong had uh, completed his activities, along with Buzz and uh, Mike Collin, uh, it became clear that we had the capability to explore. In fact, it was clear even before that. If we were successful in Apollo 11, we would be able to explore. And so the last missions, and particularly my mission, were designed to be exploration missions. And so we all know that on Apollo 11, they collected maybe 40 pounds of moon rocks, but I understand you kind of beat them. How, how much did you collect? Well, we did set the record at 240 pounds, wow. but the total <laughs> of six landings brought back 850 pounds wow. of, of lunar rocks. And those rocks are really the Apollo mission that continues. Exactly. Because the lunar scientists and planetary scientists continue to work on those and almost certainly will indefinitely. Yeah, and I understand that earlier this month, you and an astronaut candidate what was her name? Jessica Watkins Jessica and Watkins. I had a great time in the uh, rock lab. At, yeah, uh, back at Johnson Space Johnson Center. Johnson Space Center, the old man spacecraft center. Yeah. And uh, we were narrating a great deal of activity there about the samples yeah, for, I think for, we have that for NASA. Yeah, let's take a look real quick. So all of these these samples are very different. And of course, the we just talked about the sampling strategy from Neil Armstrong on Paul Levin, but um, by a by 17, the sampling strategy was a little bit different. Can you talk about kind of what the what went into your sampling strategy and how you chose which samples to bring back? Well, the whole uh, background for Apollo 17 was to, since we knew it was going to be the final Apollo mission, right. was to fill in as many of the gaps as we could, both in the sample collection and in the kinds of features that we looked at, and that turned out pretty well. We did. So there are all sorts of stories that come out of these rocks uh, about the evolution of particular uh, materials, particular rocks uh, on the moon. Jessica, they have uh, what I consider one of, the, one of, if not the most important sample that Neil Armstrong collected when he thought the rock box looked empty. Right. And so he just filled it up with this material. It's the number is 10084. All of us nerds know that number and what it means. But what it, it gave us was our, our first real definitive look at what the resources at the surface of the moon might be hmm. for either lunar bases, lunar settlements, Mars exploration that's going to need resources, radiation protection, needs water, and you can heat this material up hmm. and make water anywhere on the moon. Awesome. You don't have to go to the poles to make water from ice. You can make it. You have to heat it up to about six, 700 degrees. 50 years ago, Jessica, that's when that sample came. It's still giving. Yeah, it is. It is. They all are. It's, uh, it's as if the Apollo program never ended. Right. Because uh, there are hundreds, there have been thousands now of people who have worked on the samples and still work on the samples. The advance of analytical technology means that you can go back to an old sample and get new information. Right. Dr. Schmidt, I love that these samples that we took 50 years ago are still benefiting us today and in our future endeavors. Thank you so much for all that you've done for NASA and, and for the world, and thanks for joining us here today. Well, it's been my privilege, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Again. Absolutely. We're going to send it back inside where we're going to hear more about what we still have to learn from the moon. All right, thanks to both of you. It's so incredible to hear about these moon rocks they brought back, you know, 50 years ago, and they're still teaching us things today. Yeah, the astronaut from Apollo teaching the up-and-coming geologist. I mean, it's 
What a great story that yeah, is. It's really awesome. And unlocking those scientific mysteries is one of the main reasons we explore, whether it's at the moon or our home planet, or even the farthest reaches of our solar system. Yeah, Kelsey Young, a scientist from our Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, has more on what we already know and what we hope to learn about our closest celestial neighbor. The six Apollo lunar surface missions were able to collect an incredible amount of samples that are continuing to yield exciting scientific discoveries even today. Through analyzing these samples and through missions like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and the LCROSS mission, we're actually able to discover that there's water on the moon. While we haven't been able to determine just how much water is there, we know it's there in quantities great enough that we can actually start thinking about what to do with it. Through in-situ resource utilization, we'll be able to turn this water into usable products like drinking water or fuel, which will enable us to establish a long-term sustainable presence on the lunar surface. It's absolutely critical that future human and robotic missions to the moon will help quantify just how much water is there, as well as to just continue answering the really exciting and important science questions we have left about the moon. Education has always been a part of the NASA mission. Stay with us on NASA TV at 3 Eastern for our next show called STEM, Forward to the Moon. We visited students across the country taking the science behind a mission to the moon and breaking it down into activities you can do at home. Stay with us for that coming up at 3. And next up, we want to go to Danielle Russo. She's been mingling with the crowd here. And Danielle, are you meeting some interesting folks? Thanks, Marie. 11, it's personal to a lot of people, whether that be actually watching the launch, reading about it, or just being an overall space enthusiast. But for me, it's about family. My grandfather was the command module pilot on Apollo 14, and his capsule is actually here at Kennedy Space Center. To be in the same place with the capsule is truly inspiring, and I'm beyond grateful to be here. But today, I have a very special guest. Keenan, why don't you come in here? He is 10 years old. He's visiting Kennedy Space Center. So, what is the longest car ride you've been on? Probably about six hours. Six hours, wow, okay. Imagine being in a capsule with two other people squished together for nine days. How does that sound? Probably overheated and squished. Overheated and squished, and there's probably not any Wi-Fi. Um, okay, and what is your favorite planet? Probably the moon, because it looks like cheese. The moon, because it looks like cheese. Great. And are you enjoying your day here at Kennedy Space Center? Yes. All right. Great. Well, that's all I have right now, and uh, we'll be circling back soon. All right. Thanks, Danielle. It's great to see those young kids being so excited about seeing how we went to the moon, and, you know, they're dreaming about being the next generation to go up there. And there's so many of them here inside the Saturn V Center. So you can hear them in the background yeah. just filling this place up, which is great. Well, now, the Apollo 11 command module is on tour, and right now it's out in Seattle. That's the one that was uh, uh, piloted uh, by the Apollo 11 astronauts, and it's out with, Natalie's, with Natalie Joseph of NASA out in Seattle. Natalie. Hi, we're at the Museum of Flight in Seattle, the largest independently owned nonprofit air museum in the world. It's also the temporary home to Apollo 11 Command Module Columbia, the only part of the spacecraft to return back to Earth. And more than 55,000 people have already been here to see it in Seattle. And the festivities continue as more visitors roll in to celebrate the Apollo 50th anniversary. One thing that visitors can't easily see, though, is an interesting piece of graffiti inside Columbia. After splashdown, command module pilot Mike Collins scribbled a quick tribute inside the lower equipment bay, praising Columbia as the best ship to come down the line. Now NASA has a new ship coming down the line, Orion, a new capsule that will send humans farther than ever before. Astronaut Randy Bresnik compares Orion to Apollo. Orion is the vehicle that's going to take and put the next man and the first woman on the moon by 2024. It's the vehicle that has to take us out of Earth's atmosphere, safely across the expanse of 250,000 miles to the moon, put us in a lunar orbit at the Gateway Space Station, and then sit there and wait while the astronauts go down to the lunar surface for the first time since 1972. Then the astronauts have to come back up to the gateway, get on Orion, come back home, re-enter Earth's atmosphere, and Orion's going to be the ones who will get us back safely on the ground. Now, the laws of physics still apply the same as they did back in the 1960s. 
we had to come back from lunar return velocities, Mach 32, and dissipate all that energy. So that shape of the capsule that you see behind us is pretty much the same. We've got a heat shield underneath that uh, allows us to get re enter the atmosphere. The big thing is when you get inside, it's 30% larger. Orion can carry four crew for 21 days, where Apollo was three crew for 14 days. Now, it's also taking a lot of advantage of technology developments, where now we've got glass cockpit. We've got digital displays to control all the systems and are able to give that to us in a digital form, pull up our electronic procedures and emergency function. It also has a lot of better computing power and compares to Apollo 4,000 times faster than the Apollo computers because Apollo computers had less computing power than we have in our watches these days. A lot more safety redundancies. Uh, it also has composite materials. We're able to make it lighter. We're also able to use 3D printing to make things that we couldn't make before. So it's really, really uh, going to be you know, the next generation vehicle that uh, allows us to have that return to the moon in 2024 and then keep going back every year after that and make that sustained presence on that south pole that allows us to do all the things we need to to be able to be ready to go from the moon to Mars shortly thereafter. I'm joined by NASA astronaut and physician Dr. Michael Barrett. Hey, Mike, how does it feel to be back in your home state? Well, it's great to be back in the great state of Washington and here at the Museum of Flight. And uh, one special thing for me is I launched on a Soyuz, which is across the street right over here. The last time I had seen it was uh, smoking from reentry in the desert of Kazakhstan, and now it's here. So it's great. That is awesome. So you mentioned you've launched on a Soyuz, but you've also launched on a shuttle. And so how would you feel about taking a ride in Orion? Well, I think uh, the Soyuz and the shuttle have been fabulous spacecraft, and they have done their job in getting people to lower Earth orbit for years, and they've done that magnificently. But the Orion is a very different beast. It is designed to take us away from low Earth orbit and out into missions of exploration of the moon and beyond. All of us would love that. And there's something more in that we've all had a hand in the astronaut office in designing and building the Orion. We have a birth connection, if you will, that we really haven't seen between crew members and their spaceships for a couple of decades. So how would I fly it? I'd fly it like I'm going somewhere awesome, and I'd fly it like it belongs to all of us. That's awesome. And so one of Orion's jobs is also to sustain the crew. So what are some human factors issues that humans in space may face during long duration flights and as we get closer to sending humans to Mars? Yeah, that's a great question. We're pretty good at uh, flying for six months in weightlessness, and the human has shown just an incredible capacity to adapt to that. But when you break orbit and you head to Mars and you may be gone for three years, the Earth gets smaller and you can't evacuate to Earth if something medical happens. So you have to be totally autonomous and self-capable. And then we're looking at the cumulative effects of months and years of weightlessness or the fractional gravity on Mars. And there's a little bit more radiation. There's nutritional aspects of it all. Now, we have shown tremendous capacity to adapt, and we will see that. We just have to approach this, I would say, methodically and thoughtfully and document as we go. But there's no question that uh, we'll meet these challenges and we'll be great explorers. Well, thank you, Mike, and happy Apollo 50th. Thank you. Thanks. And now we're joined by some visitors of the museum. Come on, come join me. What is your name? What are your names and where are you from? My name is Jeremiah Jones and I am from Tacoma, Washington. I'm Dan Miller. I'm from Federway, Washington. Awesome. So you guys saw Columbia, right? We did. We saw it. It's amazing to see it on the ground, but to remember seeing it when it landed and when it launched, it's just an amazing thing to see. And how was it for you, Jeremiah? It was great. I really loved it. It was um, the first time I actually, like, uh, really got to experience something like this, and I really loved it. I really would um, recommend for anyone to come and see it. All right. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for joining us here in Seattle. Back to the Saturn V Center. All right. Thank you very much, Natalie. All the way from Seattle, Washington to here in Florida, 3,000 miles away, you're looking live at pad 39B here in Florida, the future of Orion, where it will launch back into space aboard an SLS rocket once complete, the most powerful rocket in the world. Well, we've been looking at Apollo 11 then, Apollo 11 now we celebrate, Apollo 11 forever. Just hours ago in this gallery, the U.S. Postal Service issued a 50th anniversary commemorative stamp two forever stamps in fact one stamp featuring armstrong's iconic photograph of aldrin in his spacesuit on the surface of the moon the other stamp that you see there on the right a photograph of the moon showing the landing 
site of the Lunar Module Eagle in the Sea of Tranquility. A nice moment right here in the Saturn V's center. Now, it was in that spot that 50 years ago today, Neil Armstrong took the first steps by any human onto another world. And those moments held people transfixed in front of the television sets around the world. Great spot there. Roger. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. We could see it as it was happening. We could watch on live television. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. And the fact that 600 million people around the world were either watching or listening on radio and TV as it happened is a measure of the impact that this thing had on the world's consciousness. The surface, as, as we said, uh, was, was fine grain with lots of rocks in it. It took footprints very well and the footprints stayed in place. Uh, the, uh, the limb was in, in good shape and uh, it, it exhibited no damage from uh, the landing or the descent. It's a picture of the ladder with the uh, well-known plaque. Here, man, from the planet Earth. First step foot upon the moon, July 1969, AD. It came in peace for all mankind. After the, the flight of Apollo 11, uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and I had an around the world tour, and uh, every place we went, I, I thought they'd in some places have the attitude of, oh, well, you Americans finally did this. Not at all. They, uh, the, the attitude. Every country, uh, regardless of their internal politics, uh, they all said, we did it, we humans. Everything before July 20th, 1969, humans only had experience on one planetary body. From that moment on, we were, at least in some measure, a multi-planetary species. When Neil and Buzz uh, walked on the moon, uh, they did it, of course, without weapons. The only thing they brought was cameras. So it was a very, it was a, a peaceful, uh, enterprise and one that was applauded uh, worldwide. Of course, before we explore the lunar surface, we have to get to the surface. And for decades, NASA has shown how robotic and human exploration can work together to understand this distant world, and our future plans are no different. <laughs> As we look back, uncrewed robotic observers open our eyes to new frontiers. Cameras and instruments prepare the way for future human explorers. Ranger 9 space group impacted on the moon 24 March 1965. Robotic satellites, test missions, and landing craft paved the way to human piloted missions. Today, NASA and our international partners watch our lunar neighbor from above as we prepare commercial landers for new science missions to the moon. It's been said Choosing to go to the moon is hard, and we've done that. Now we're going back, sustainably, and on to Mars. Early landers laid the groundwork for putting us on the moon. Now the director of NASA's Human Lunar Exploration Programs explains what's next for landers of the Artemis generation. I'm standing in front of the Apollo Lunar Module. Although this one never flew, it's exactly the same size and scale as the one Neil and Buzz used to fly to the surface of the moon 50 years ago. The Apollo Lunar Module was actually two vehicles together as one. The crew boarded the vehicle in orbit, and they landed on the surface of the moon. 
Once they landed and completed their mission, the top part of the vehicle would then leave and go back to orbit where they would board the command module to return home to Earth. The Artemis human landing system will work very similar to the Apollo. We'll have an ascent and descent stage that will land on the surface of the moon. However, it's going to be updated to 21st century technology. We're going to have advanced flight computers. We will have lighter components and systems. And most importantly, we'll be able to carry up to four astronauts. And it will allow us to land the first woman and the next man on the surface of the moon. The Gateway is a place where the landing system and the Orion crew that's delivered by the Orion will come together and the crew will actually board the, human, the Artemis human landing system, will go to the surface of the moon. When the mission is complete, they will return to the Gateway. The Gateway actually allows us to go anywhere on the surface of the moon and we really want to go to the South Pole because we believe there's water there and we can use water to learn how to live and operate on other planets. The systems we're developing to take us to the moon are actually the systems we're going to use to go to Mars and beyond taking humans further and farther than we've ever been before. And rejoining us now is an astronaut who's done two spacewalks at the International Space Station. Stan Love, welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, Stan, so you flew in a glider, the shuttle, when it landed. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to be in a spacecraft landing on the moon or possibly even Mars? Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. No hesitation. Nobody in my office is thinking about anything else. Yeah. Um, so it'll be a different kind of landing, of course. You know, the shuttle landed like an airplane, but of course, uh, it landed as a glider. You got exactly one chance to put it on the concrete rather than in the swamp with the alligators. Uh, so it was important to get things right. And that will go for landing on rockets on another planet as well. Um, the moon and Mars don't have an atmosphere. You can't use wings for lift. You have to land on the thrust of a rocket engine. Um, this brings up an interesting difference between landing on the moon and landing on Mars. Uh, when we landed on the moon during Apollo, go again, we're probably going to have a two-part spacecraft. Part with the crew in it and a part with uh, engines and legs for landing. And you'll be burning that little engine on your way down. And however, the part that you're in as the crew has its own propulsion to take you back up away from the moon and into orbit, which means that if something bad happens on the way down, that engine quits, or you land and a leg collapses and you're about to tip over, you can just pop off and go back up to orbit and sort out what you're going to do next. But you are in your own ascent module already the whole way down. On Mars, however, Mars is a planet. It's hard to get off planets. That's why we have these gigantic rockets to get us off of Earth. Mars is a lot bigger than the moon. Not as big as the Earth, but bigger than the moon. So that ascent vehicle is too big for a descent module to carry and land softly on the surface. So you are in your descent module, and you'll probably land and walk over to your ascent module and launch in that when it's time to go home. But that means you don't have that backup spacecraft with you when you're doing your landing. So you absolutely have to get it right on the first time. You can't hit a boulder, the engine can't quit, the landing leg can't collapse. So that's another reason why the moon is a great place to practice before we're ready to go on Mars. Oh, good proving ground indeed. Yep. All right, right, thank you so much, Stan, and I know there's a lot of young people looking up to you today, so thank you so much for being with us. Thanks. All right, and as we continue our coverage, we want to take you to a video from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, showing a corn maze there. If you look closely on the left side of your screen, you can see the outline of an astronaut. Stan, is that you over there? I'm afraid not. I wish it were. <laughs> it kind of looks like you a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> in the background, that can't be me. <laughs> yeah, and there, right there is the world's largest moon pie Whoa. that made an appearance at the Visitor Center um, over at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. And some of our employees, not those here at Kennedy, but over at Marshall, got to sample it. Looks like they enjoyed it over there. And now we want to send it back over to Danielle Rusa. She's at the Apollo Saturn, Saturn V Center just upstairs. Danielle, how are some folks out here celebrating the 50th anniversary? Well, I'm back here at Kennedy Space Center, and I am reading some of the social media comments that you guys have sent to us using hashtag Apollo 50th. One of which is, Twitter user Addy observes that 50 years ago, NASA's Apollo 11 mission changed our world and ideas of what is possible by successfully landing humans on the moon's surface and bringing them home safely for the first time in history. If you truly think about how many things had to have gone right for us to successfully land on the moon, it is truly mind-blowing. 3Vox on Twitter writes, the Apollo 11 mission was an immense feat of engineering and completely changed our understanding of the solar system. Couldn't be more true. Look at the Apollo 8 Earthrise image. The way that we saw the Earth totally transform in that one photo. 
All right. Well, thanks so much. We look forward to hearing more of your social media comments. Send them over. Hashtag Apollo 50th. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Danielle. Now let's go back over to Washington, D.C. for a look at spacesuits. Man, I am so obsessed with spacesuits. I love seeing all those pictures of spacesuits over the years. Of course, inside the National Air and Space Museum right now, the OG original spacesuit that Neil Armstrong wore on as when the Eagle landed back in 1969 has been restored and went on display this week. Restoration was funded by the public through a Kickstarter campaign and museum goers can now see it for the first time in 13 years. I am here with NASA spacesuit engineer Lindsay Aitchison and astronaut Randy Bresnik. Uh, Lindsay, what are the key differences between the legacy suits that you guys are currently using, the so-called ACES, the EMU, and the new generation of suits? One of our biggest changes for the EVA suits is we're trying to make them an evolvable architecture. So you have one single core architecture that meets every destination from low Earth orbit and ISS all the way to the surface of Mars. Oh, really? So not separate suits for each stage? Exactly. So if you think about our life support system, it's kind of like the motherboard on your computer. As you get new technologies, you can just pluck out the old bit and plug in a new piece. So that's really a great way to keep going so we don't have to do a new suit for every mission. And Randy, you are actually testing these new generations of suits for Artemis. Is that correct? It's great. We've gone testing on how we're going to actually have the suit fit. Where, where do we need the mobility? Uh, are we able to use things like suit ports and be able to leave the suit outside and be able to come inside through a, a little hatchway in the back of the suit? That's my favorite new thing. How are you testing that? In giant vacuum chambers? In fact, we are. We have a giant vacuum chamber at the Johnson Space Center. And a couple of years ago, we took one of the prototype suits called Z1, and we actually had it inside the uh, vacuum chamber. And so the, the chamber's at vacuum. Inside, I'm in, getting ready to hop in it, you know, at like 10.2 PSI. And so the suit's all stiff, like it's out in the spacewalk. And you got to crawl inside the back of the suit, get your arms and legs into it. They close up the back of the suit, and then we close the hatch, and then actually detach the suit and vacuum and did a bunch of mobility translations around the area. What can we reach? What can we touch? But then the key point to the suit port uh, testing was actually backing up. Oh, going home, the getting, back in. getting back in. Because obviously you need to get hooked back up to be able to get inside the, the doorway. And so we worked on the different ways to be able to see or be able to feel or, or make little uh, guides to guide you back in to be able to open it back up and then crawl back out. Oh. Uh, now, uh, Tahira has a question from a fan out on the mall. Tahira, what, what have we got? Hi, it's Tahira again from the National Mall. Right now, I just got done checking out some of these amazing exhibits that are here celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo, but also showcasing some of our future plans for our Artemis missions to return to the moon and eventually go farther beyond to Mars. Joining us right now are Carly and some of her friends from Maryland, and they have a question for Randy and Lindsay. So what does it mean for the US space program to be able to go back to the moon? Randy, the question is, what does it mean for the U.S. space program to go back to the moon? Well, we look at it as going forward to the moon. I mean, the moon is a stepping stone, you know, the way that lights the path to Mars. But it's the important part because we need to test out all the rovers, all the suits, all the habitats, all the hatches, and make sure that everything can work. Because when we go to Mars, we're not three days away from Earth and just can come on back if we need to. We are literally over a year away. I mean, it's the transit time and the fact that we have to wait till Mars gets closer to Earth to be able to come back. And so we have to make sure everything and all the risk is bought down on the hardware. The moon is where we test that out. And that's just one of the many reasons that we go back to the moon. There's a scientific aspect. There's the energy aspect. I mean, the moon is just a great treasure trove of scientific and energy types of uh, uh, opportunities for us to go explore and learn more because the last time we were there 50 years ago, it was just for a few days at a time. We're going there to stay now. Amazing. Randy, Lindsay, thank you guys so much. Karen Fox is inside the National Air and Space Museum right now with another special guest.
I am here with General Tom Stafford. He was commander of Apollo 10. That mission was a dress rehearsal for Apollo 11. The crew orbited the moon. It descended close to the surface, but without actually landing. General Stafford, tell us a little bit about the legacy of the Apollo program for today. Well, the legacy of Apollo was we started with nearly the impossible, and we did it in such an impossible short period of time and so successfully. The, um, the lessons learned, if we think we can do something new, innovative, more, I, I don't think we could probably get much better as far as management, how we did that program. You know, President Kennedy on May the 25th, 1961, said we'll go to the moon and safely return, which is great. And, uh, but uh, the question is, how do we go to the moon? It wasn't until 12 months later that uh, it was decided how we'll go to the moon, which is a lunar orbit rendezvous. And if we had to make a decision, and all the main leaders in NASA had different ideas, and it was floating around, like you have different ideas today, what you can do. But it came out to the senior engineer at Langley, John Hubolt, and his team said, he pro proved to um, Dr. Siemens, a great deputy administrator, former dean of Aero and Astro at MIT, that the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous could do it in a way that would be a smaller vehicle, it would be, you could do it faster, far less cost, and it would be safer. And so that was, so Siemens stuck and knocked the other people's heads together and said, this is the way we're going to go. And then I was fortunate, I came on board the program with the second group of astronauts two months later. Thank you so much. You were also the commander of the Apollo Soyuz Test Project in 1975, uh, when American astronauts and Soviet cosmonauts met in space for the first time. Uh, we are going to have an example of a real-time international space partnership tomorrow on the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11's landing. Uh, NASA astronaut uh, Drew Morgan and European Space Agency astronaut Luca Parmitano will launch alongside Russian cosmonaut Alexander Skvortsov on a Soyuz rocket to the International Space Station. I think that it's a huge honor for both my crew, my Soyuz crew, as well as the entire crew of Expedition 60 that will be joining. The Apollo program proved that if humans put their ingenuity to, to a scope, then really anything is possible. We want to explore, we want to improve our technology and improve our science. And this is going to enable us to go further into the solar system and the moon is a stepping point along the way as we go deeper and we head to Mars. And I would love to see a program that takes us to the moon for science, for more technological advance. My mission up to the ISS is a stepping stone in that direction and I'm very, very excited and honored to be serving this way. And our current station crew members, Nick Haig and Christina Cook, also shared their thoughts about Apollo's legacy. You know, growing up in a generation such as we did, post-Apollo, we never knew a world where people had not walked on the moon. When we looked at the moon at night, it didn't seem as distant as it may have seemed to the generation prior to the Apollo mission. These spacesuits take their heritage from the Apollo program and uh, the equipment, the technology that was proven out then, we continue to refine as we get ready to embark on our journey back to the moon. So going back to the moon in so many ways is going to inspire this next generation. One of the reasons it's so important on a generational level is to demonstrate that as humans, as a country or as an international partnership, when we come together to achieve something great, we can be successful. It's going to take international partners. It's going to take commercial partners. It's going to bring us together. The goal of landing the first woman on the moon means so very much to me. It's wonderful to be participating in the space program, especially as an astronaut, but as any person participating, at a time when we are harnessing all of the talents, skills, ideas, and innovation from everyone who wants to participate, not just a select few. The Apollo astronauts, uh, they're the ones that set everything in motion to get us back to today, and it may seem like we've come to the moon a second time or we've returned to the moon but really our space program has been moving forward uh, from day one and and the the next crew that steps on the moon is just another step 
in that long line of the program moving things forward. We're in the Stone Age of it, I think. There's so much we don't know, so much we um, but you've got to keep exploring. I'm, you have to. Uh, the, the greatest thing a human mind can do is explore, whether it's reading, creating, painting, or you know. And these guys are pioneers, and they're exploring for the benefit or, or, or of our knowledge. And uh, with thirst, the thirst for knowledge is the most important thing in the world. Welcome back to Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39. Joining us now is Regina Spellman, Pad B's Senior Project Manager, who's overseeing all the modernization of Pad B as we prepare to return to the moon. So Regina, it's good to be here. Both of these pads were built for Apollo 50 years ago. How are they holding up? They're doing great. These, these pads were built with some of the best engineering back in the 60s, and they have withstood now two whole programs of, of space flight, and they're ready for the third. The pad, uh, uh, pad B has gotten a complete makeover. We have modernized her and refurbished her, and she is ready for space flight. What are some of the things that you've been doing out there to, to modernize Pad B? So for SLS and Orion, we're going to a clean pad architecture. So one of the first things that we did was to get rid of some of the old shuttle infrastructure and go to a clean pad so we have minimal permanent infrastructure out the pad. We have over the last 10 years gone in and modernized every system out there. I can't think of a single system out there that we haven't touched in some way or another. Everything has been updated and modernized, taking out old Apollo era, some shuttle era, and putting in new technologies, taking what was old and was useful and really good, and building upon it. And I love it. I love that we're taking these pads, this pad that was built to go to the moon, and we're now going to go to the moon again. Absolutely. I, I love it. It's coming full circle. It's going to be really exciting. Thanks so much for being with us, Regina. Happy and to we're be here. going to head it back to Danielle. Hey guys, we're right behind the Saturn V here. We have two very exciting KSE guests. We have Deb and Akash. So what inspired this trip? Well, when I was six, I remember watching the moon landing on TV, and it was, it was such an awe-inspiring event. I wanted to bring the family here. Amazing. So is this your first time? Yes, it is. Well, what exhibit are you looking forward to seeing, or have already seen? Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing um, the takeoff tomorrow to celebrate the 50th anniversary. That would be great. Yeah, takeoff. So do you want to go to space? Definitely, yeah. All right, NASA, you got your next astronaut right here. All right, back to you guys. Come up. Thank you so much, Danielle. Well, it's been great being with you for the Saturn V Center here where we hosted our NASA show, a look ahead and a look behind at Apollo 11. Now, just ahead, our STEM show, Forward to the Moon, is coming up, and we'll have a fun reveal about the Artemis program, so yes. make sure you stay tuned for that. Yes, that's right, but first, the final word today on Apollo 11 is from the commander, Neil Armstrong. At this time, I'd like to introduce the Apollo 11 crew, astronauts Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Edwin Alden. It was the ultimate peaceful competition, USA versus USSR. I'll not assert that uh, it was a diversion which prevented a war. Nevertheless, it was a diversion. It was intense. It did allow to both sides to take the high road with the objectives of science and learning and exploration eventually provided a mechanism for engendering cooperation between former adversaries. In that sense, among others, it was an exceptional national investment for both sides. Welcome back to DC. I am here with NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. It has been so inspiring to be here with you all. Uh, Jim, tell us about the next giant leap. Absolutely. You've heard a lot today about the incredible accomplishments of Apollo. There are now several generations of Americans who have dreamed about returning to the moon and going beyond it. Many were born well after the Apollo program ended. Now we're charged with sending humans to Mars and first, We'll prepare for that journey at the moon. We call, this, we call this program Artemis. And today I'm proud to share with you for the very first time, the Artemis logo. This is the image of exploration that will carry us as we once again send humans beyond Earth orbit. We invite all of you to join us and follow the story at nasa.gov slash Artemis. There is much work to be done and many great stories to tell along the way. Stories of perseverance, exploration and discovery, stories of humanity, 
once again pressing outward into the unknown. We are going. And as we go, I hope that women and men of all ages and all backgrounds will consider themselves part of this, the Artemis generation. 50 years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers, this time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we would discover life-saving, earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go.
before. We're going again. This time to stay. Visionaries and dreamers imagine the future. Engineers and scientists build it. Using math and science as forms of art. Creating technologies, transforming societies. Now, we take civilization to the stars on a journey to explore and build a gateway, an outpost, the future. Good afternoon and welcome to our show, STEM Forge the Moon. We're live from the Apollo Saturn V Center at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where we just wrapped up a two-hour celebration commemorating the 50th anniversary of the first ever walk on the surface of the moon. We turn now to the future of space exploration, to you, the students and educators. Thanks for joining us and welcome to our show. I'm Stephanie Martin from NASA's Office of Communications, and I'm here with my co-host and friend, Nilifer Ramji from NASA's Office of STEM Engagement. We are part of the Artemis generation of explorers. We're going back to the moon, and this time to stay. We just saw the new Artemis branding, which is truly a nod to the Apollo missions. What many people don't know is Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. As the Artemis generation, we need to develop the skills to get us to the moon and beyond. NASA's Office of STEM Engagement works with educators, schools, and other organizations like museums to immerse students in NASA's work and enhance literacy in science, technology, engineering, and math. Generally, we're here to inspire the next generation to explore. Coming up, we'll see an Artemis mission through the eyes of middle school students from museums across the country. We'll also see those same students perform experiments that show how you can recreate them from uh, your home using things that you can find around the house. Later in the show, we'll also have a message from a special celebrity guest. We want everyone to join the Forward to the Moon conversation using the hashtag NASA STEM on Twitter. My team is standing by to answer your questions on social media. I hope you join our conversation online. Let's get started. As Stephanie mentioned, I caught up with middle school students across the country this summer who used their imagination to see what it would, what it would be like if they took over an Artemis moon mission. They simulated a launch, arrived at the lunar gateway, took their first steps on the moon, and even collected samples on the lunar surface. First up, we'll take you inside Mission Control from the Cosmosphere in Kansas. Welcome to the Space Launch, Artemis 3 crew. You have been training many months for the greatest adventure of your whole life. I know you're a little bit nervous, but that is normal. You will be exploring our solar system, beginning with the moon, and eventually onto Mars. When you hear the words, go for launch, all systems will be a go. T-minus three minutes and counting. I think it's important for NASA to send people to the moon and to Mars because they can do experiments to help people back on Earth. What excites me about Artemis is that it's gonna have the first woman on the moon and there hasn't been one before and that's really cool. Artemis 3, you are go for launch. Main engine start, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Solid rocket booster ignition and lift off. Artemis is clear the tower. Welcome to the solar system, Artemis 3. You just passed the International Space Station and should see the lunar gateway and moon in the distance soon. Navigator, fire rockets on lunar orbit insertion now. Thank you, Capcom. We will check in as we near gateway and are getting ready to dock at Astra. This is one step closer to a future where better things can happen. So here at Kennedy Space Center, we have Launch Complex 39. That is where Pad 39A and 39B were used for the Apollo missions and are key to the future exploration of uh, human spaceflight. Pad 39A is where SpaceX will launch our astronauts in the future to the International Space Station, and you can see that on the left-hand side of your screen. Pad 39B is on the right, and that is where our heavy lift rocket, known as the Space Launch System, will carry the Orion spacecraft for Artemis missions to the moon and on to Mars. 
We've been hearing a lot about Artemis today. Stephanie, can you tell us a little more? To really simplify it, our Apollo missions were focused on getting astronauts safely to and from the moon. For Artemis, we're going to send our astronauts back to the moon, and there they will explore. And they will utilize that experience to prepare us to take the next giant leap to send our astronauts to Mars. And Artemis will require a heavy lift vehicle, the Space Launch System. The students we met at the Cosmosphere also conducted an experiment using balloons as air-powered rockets to launch the largest pay payload possible. This science activity teaches students what it takes to launch a payload into orbit and even how slight variations in weight can affect performance. Let's take a look. Here with me we have Melissa from the Cosmosphere in Hutchinson, Kansas, and she's going to talk to us about an activity these guys are doing. Yes, they're doing the NASA activity heavy lifting. It is a payload activity to test the amount of payload they can uh, evenly distribute and how to distribute it onto their rocket ship. Each uh, paper clip is equal to two grams of weight, Got and it. they're uh, challenges to get as many paper clips onto the uh, rocket as possible and be able to reach the ceiling. You just need an elongated balloon, some paper clips, and a clothespin to stop the airflow, and some masking tape. All right, so why don't we check out what we have going on on this side? It looks like Drew and Emma over here have some of their activity started. Yes, uh, Drew, ha Drew has a strategy where he's going to uh, condense up his payload into a, a, into a bag and distribute it onto the rocket and experiment with the best location to put his payload for the maximum height. And Emma it has a different strategy where she is chaining the paper clips and uh, will evenly distribute them onto and tape them onto her rocket uh, to maximize her payload and, and the height of her rocket. Right, and then the idea is to test the different payloads to see what happens or which one launches? Exactly, so they're gonna start with a very light payload and they'll increase their tests each time by a few grams until they maximize their payload. Excellent. So why don't we see what it looks like to launch this thing? So it looks like Madeline and David have finished their products. Yes, uh, we have a couple different design ideas. One is to keep the payload together and at the bottom. And then the other design is to uh, chain the payload and, and distribute the weight all the way down the length of the rocket. Oh, great, very nice. So are we able to watch one of these get launched? Sure, let's try okay, it. Okay, let's try it out. Right. Okay, so we're gonna launch, ready? Is everyone counting? Three, Three two, two, one. Why don't we try this with another payload? All right, so Madeline and her partner have put an additional paper clip onto this balloon. I'm really excited to see what happens with this one. Are you guys excited? Yeah. Okay, let's, right. let's count down, ready? Three, two, one. Whoa. So for those of you who would like to try this activity at home, please feel free to visit the website at the bottom of the screen and you're more than welcome to partake in this really awesome exercise. The heavy lift experiment and many others are in our STEM Forge of the Moon activity guide. Parents, educators, and students can go to the website and download the book. There is a ton of really fun kitchen science in there. I had a lot of fun with them myself. In fact, the water filtration activity you will see coming up was my favorite. And Stephanie, all of these activities can be done at home using the activity guide. From launching to living on the moon, there's a lot to learn. Museums across the country are hosting watch parties just like the one that is in, Nash in the National Mall in Washington, D.C. It was coordinated by NASA and the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum. Here you can see uh, the monument in the background with all of the exhibits along both sides. Many of them have big events that are being hosted even tomorrow to commemorate the big Apollo 11 mission. And each night this week, an image of a Saturn V rocket was being projected onto the side of the Washington Monument. And starting tonight and tomorrow, a 17-minute animated show will tell the story of the launch and landing of Apollo 11. That's happening at the National Mall in Washington, D.C. If you're in the nation's capital this week, it sounds like something really worth seeing. 
It really does. As you can see with that, that rocket on the pad as it's displayed on the monument, it's just amazing. I, I wish I was in D.C. if I wasn't actually able to be here with all of you today. Exactly. And despite the heat index, it would have been a great adventure. It sure <laughs> would have. So a few moments ago, we saw a mission simulation at the Cosmosphere where we had students actually in a mission simulator. I'm amazed how interactive these museums are. Right, and it's so great to have these experiences available to the students. NASA partnerships are crucial in engaging students in NASA's mission. Not only do they provide learning opportunities for students, they also enhance the capabilities of educational institutions and support educators to better engage the students. At the Columbia Memorial Space Center in California, for example, students can return to the moon or voyage to Mars in their interactive space mission simulator. They're a challenger learning center where students can experience the journey of exploration and teamwork. Exactly, and students there took their imagination to new heights as they thought through what it might be like to be aboard the Lunar Gateway, the station that will orbit the moon and become a rest stop as we travel further to Mars someday. I was there with our camera crew as these middle schoolers prepared to land on the moon. They had a lot of fun. Let's watch. Gateway, tracking your orbit. How do you read for landing? Mission control, orbit established for landing on the moon's south pole. I think it's important to send people to the moon and onto Mars because discovery is a big thing and the more you explore, the more you know. Initiating system checks on lunar lander. Power systems. Power systems, go. Communications. Comms, go. I've always wanted to go to the moon. I wanted to be one of the first women on the moon. I wanted to be first. So that kind of be like a big dream come true that we're going back during my time. Environmental controls. Environment controls, go. I think the most important experiment to do on the moon would most likely be seeing if we could find some way to make people able to live on there. It's going to be the first woman to go on, and it's showing just how much things have changed since the first landing on the moon. Flight systems. Flight systems, go. Lander systems responding with green across the board. Confirm, Houston. Confirmed gateway. Lander systems green. Proceed with descent operations. Roger, Mission Control, proceeding with descent operations. What excites me the most about going forward to the moon is like creating a whole new life and being able to discover more than we thought. Lunar expedition seats are secured. Expedition team moving to lander. What excites me the most about um, going forward to the moon is the learning opportunity. I think it's amazing that during my lifetime and during, like, especially me at this age, I'll be able to experience something like this. Expedition team has entered the lander. Hatch is secure. Pressure check on lander. Pressure good. Holding nominal. Initiating release. Seals released. Lander backing away. Two meters. Four meters. Six meters. You are clear, Expedition Lander. Godspeed, Chloe and Lenora. Safe travels, Expedition. And don't forget our souvenirs. The Lunar Gateway that these young women just shared with us, it is such a different approach from what we had during Apollo. That's right, Stephanie. It's a huge innovation. Gateway gives us the opportunity to land anywhere on the surface of the moon. It will also be a rest stop and staging area as we continue to go on to Mars. Now, a journey to the moon takes about three days each way, and a great way to pass the time is with music. Stephanie, music has actually been part of tra space travel from the beginning, right? It really has. There were pre-launch songs, shuttle crew wake-up songs, and some astronauts have even played instruments on the International Space Station to bring a part of home to the space station with them. With NASA returning to the moon by 2024, we asked people what they thought should be on the playlist for the journey and created Moon Tunes. You can listen on Third Rock Radio or use the hashtag NASA Moon Tunes to learn more. One of the tunes that made the playlist is the song Moon in the Water by Dawes. But for our astronauts, when they travel to the moon, one important aspect is going to be making sure they have clean water on the moon. Nilifer, you recently worked with students on a water filtration experiment. That's right, I did. This activity gets students thinking about some of the necessities of survival when it comes to living and working in space. In this case, we looked at some of the science behind cleaning water, at, 
and creating a water filtration system. Let's go back to the Columbia Memorial Space Center and see how it went. We're with Brianna at the Columbia Memorial Space Center, and today we're going to be doing a cleaning water activity. Yeah, so cleaning water is so important. Right. So I thought, you know, we can make a water filter activity and just really get the importance of water and why we need clean water. Exactly, and uh, as the astronauts say on the International Space Station, tomorrow's coffee oh, was yeah. yesterday's coffee. Got to recycle everything we can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So right here, I have some necessary materials that we do for the filter. Great. I have some beans, different kind of beans, some aquarium gravel, because it's very colorful. I have some peas and also rice and our favorite, cotton balls. Excellent. Also, just to organize some things, I have, uh, you know, a filter to filter it through, some goggles, safety first. Exactly. And... Also, I got some pH papers so we can actually Great. see if our water is filtered. Awesome. So we have Jackie and Neve continuing the activity. Yeah. So it looks like they've already started their filter. They looks have colorful. Yeah, they have beans, green peas, wow. some rice, aquarium gravel. And it looks like they're going to add their final step, which is cotton balls, it looks like. Oh, excellent. Yeah, it's really easy. And for our dirty water that we made, we actually used Italian dressing. Which I think is really fun. That's really awesome. So you, <laughs> what you did was you mixed water with the Italian dressing? It's that easy. Wow, okay. Other times, I like to just go outside and grab some dirt. That's even more fun. I love it. I love playing with dirt. <laughs> and wow. it kind of gives a real feel. It's real dirty water. And right. they get to test it out and see if it's going to be clean. And when astronauts are on the Lunar Gateway, they're going to need systems like this yes. to be even more efficient. Heavy-duty systems. It looks like we have a completed activity here. Yeah, so it looks like everything is ready to go. Great, and the goggles are on. So safety first. I'm glad that they're ready for that. So now all they need to do is just add the dirty water. Excellent, and that water doesn't look too dirty to me. I think we need to give it a stir. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Look at that dirty water. So he's mixing the Italian dressing in the water. Excellent. <laughs> so now I would probably say it's good to try out. So we're going to try this out now? Yeah, let's, let's try it do out. it. I'm hoping it works. I hope so too. Fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, so wow. It's starting to go through. It's going through all the layers. That's faster than I would expect. Totally. And I'm actually really surprised. It looks very clean. It looks very clean. For those of you interested in participating in this activity and many others, feel free to visit the website at the bottom of our screen and take part in this important initiative. Nilifer, the water looks a little cleaner when it comes out of the filtration system on the International Space Station. <laughs> that is true, Stephanie. <laughs> our system includes a couple of technologies that you don't normally have at home, which is why we suggest students don't drink the water you filter. Absolutely <laughs> not. Now, we want STEM discoveries and experiments to be exciting for everyone. We do, and even celebrities are getting excited about NASA STEM activities. Actress and singer Kiki Palmer recently had the opportunity to learn more about our initiatives, and she shared this message about STEM and NASA's Artemis missions. Hey, Kiki Palmer here, and when I'm not on set or in the recording studio, one of my favorite things to do is to learn more about organizations like NASA and what they're doing to push the boundaries of how we understand the world around us. In addition, tons of new inventors are on the horizon, including Artemis, NASA's mission to land the first woman and next man on the moon. There's never been a better time to get involved in science, technology, engineering, or math. Visit nasa.gov STEM to learn more about how to help NASA get to the moon, Mars, and beyond. The landing of Apollo 11 is what we are commemorating today. And for the first time when we land uh, our, the, our first sorry, when we land the first Artemis mission, everyone around the world is going to be celebrating and it's really going to be something we can all look forward to. Now, Nilifer, you recently had a trip to the St. Louis Science Center. I did. We went to the St. Louis Science Center and talked to several students there. We asked them what they thought it would be like to land on the moon and showed us what they imagined the big event would be would be like. They were really excited. They got really into it. And I could see our future astronaut class in training. Artemis, this is Houston Mission Control here. You have 30 seconds of fuel remaining. We are close, drifting forward a little. 
Shut down. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Artemis. Engine is off. South pole here. Artemis has landed. Roger, we copy you on the ground. Welcome to the moon, Artemis. You're looking good. I would get my classmates excited about Artemis by telling them how we're going to go to the moon. And I just think that's really cool. It's very important for NASA to send people to the moon and Mars so that we can learn more about our planets and our solar system. And we can have new people go and experience that. We see you opening up the hatch, getting ready to take your first steps. The most important experiment to do on the moon, in my opinion, would definitely be look at ice on the moon and see if there are any signs of anything ever living there. Artemis, welcome to the moon. As we establish a permanent presence, we are closer to sending the next generation of explorers to Mars. This is Houston, out. The Museum of Flight in Seattle is celebrating the landing of Apollo 11 mission with a lunar block party for all museum guests this weekend. The Museum of Flight also hosts the Apollo 11 command module, known as Columbia, which is on display for the guests you see gathered. When living in space, shelter is vital for survival, conducting experiments, and to have a place to rest when surrounded by harsh conditions of space. And at the St. Louis Science Center, students explored what it would take to build a habitat that could be sustainable for astronauts to stay in, but also practical enough to live in. Let's take a look. We're here today at the St. Louis Science Center, and I'm here with Erin, who's going to be showing us a little bit about a habitat activity. Erin? That's right. Our astronauts have just gotten back from the moon, and they are already designing their next lunar habitats. They are busy at work drawing a, what they think would be helpful in a habitat to live if they were on the moon. Great. I can't wait to see what a habitat looks like. So we've got Evan and Nikki here, and they are working on actually building a 3D version of their habitat. And look at this. They have, it looks like they've scrounged around the house and found everything in, in the recycling bin. They have everything here has been recycled or reused. Anybody could do this at home or school, anywhere. Habitats are so important because we need astronauts to have clean drinking water and clean air to breathe. Yes, there's all kinds of different issues in space. What you said, gravity is an issue. And Nikki over here at the laboratory, how amazing is this mad scientist space lab? So he came up with a lot of ways to bring those experiments safely back. All right, I want to see a completed habitat, Erin. Let's do it. Hi, Samaya. Can you tell us a little bit about what you built for us today? Yes, I built the bedroom. And so in the bedroom, when you come in, there's a button, an on and off button. So if you want the... Gravity. The gravity. gravity on, you press the green button, and if you want it off, you press the red button. And then there's a bed, like a rollout bed with a dresser. Wow. So what do we have going on with Dylan? Um, well, I built the kitchen of the habitat, and um, there is a table right here with chairs that you can push under the table, so that way it saves more space. And then... It's just the basic stuff like the sink, but then there's a hot water tank inside of the refrigerator so important. to keep more yeah. water inside the habitat. And there's a pantry on the side over here. Wow, you thought of everything. Katie, what do you got going on? I, bu I built the living room and the gym. I thought when you come home from outer space, you would want to relax. So we have a TV and couch and a little bookcase with some chairs you can sit in and you have a treadmill you also have some oxygen and nitrogen and a computer and what's in the middle of your living room because i really like this it's a gravity button that you can push on and off if you want gravity you can push it and if you don't you can push it again okay so i think we've given people at home a really great idea yeah. on how to start their own lunar habitat yeah it your imagination and what you find in your own house is the limit. I can't wait to do this at home myself. Yeah. So for those of you interested in participating in this activity and many others, feel free to visit the website at the bottom of the screen. So we've covered launch, gateway, and landing the next mission on the moon, but there's another important step to what you've asked students to imagine. That's right. As important as all of those other aspects of the mission are, we are going to explore. So we asked students at the Arizona Science Center to envision a lunar sample mission at the moon's south pole. This is what their imagination delivered.
Houston Mission Control here. You're at the optimal lunar south pole location to begin drilling for a core sample of water ice. Are you ready to start your sample collection and analysis? Houston, this is Artemis 3. We're a go for water ice sample collection. The core drill is in position and rover analytic lab is ready. Proceed with collection and analysis. Drilling has started and is proceeding smoothly. I'm really excited for the first woman to be on the moon because it's a really good achievement for America and the whole world. I like to think of it as basically a gas station on the way to Mars because from the Earth to Mars it's pretty far away. So if we're able to go to the moon and uh, split the like hydrogen atoms inside the ice that's hopefully there and um, create rocket fuel out of that, I feel like that would be pretty cool. I think it's important to have activities that really help students understand just how important this step is in possible solar system colonization. Stop drilling. We are at the 20 inch mark. Lock drill to begin collecting sample. Collection complete. Anchor the drill for core extraction. The drill is anchored. Begin extraction. Sample ready for analysis. Open rover sample container. The container is open and ready. Begin analysis. I think it's important because it really is the first step in understanding space travel in general. Um, and along with that, especially for Mars, just being able to see whether or not there's possible biological life in the uh, ice of Mars is just amazing and it can really signal that perhaps there is a greater chance of life in our universe. I feel like there's not any experiment that's more important than any other because any experiment is any experiment. They're all equally important. Analysis complete. Houston, great news. We have 72% water ice and 28% regolith. Artemis 3, that is great news. Those numbers suggest that this is an excellent location for a long duration lunar habitat. This is an important step in helping to ensure this generation will be taking the first steps on the surface of Mars. Great work, Houston out. I feel like we can learn a lot about how the moon was formed and when we learn more about that, we can learn more about how the earth was formed and learn more on from there. I think just being able to say you're there first, um, really making the mark for the 21st century is just absolutely amazing. Man, I tell you, these kids are great. I love hearing how how excited they are for our lunar missions. And to see them as they walk through these simulations and put this, themselves in the role of flight controller or an astronaut, it's just inspirational. And I can see how interactive these simulations are. It starts really great uh, conversations in the classroom and at home. That's exactly what we aim to do with the activity guide. Encourage families to do these activities at home and talk about them. That's really what science is all about asking the questions, getting an answer, and then asking the next question from what you learned. And it was so much fun working with the kids at the different locations. I wanna send a big thank you to the Cosmosphere, the Columbia Memorial Space Center, the St. Louis Science Center, and the Arizona Science Center for all their help in making this show possible. It's great to work with such great organizations who have the same goals as NASA. Exactly. There are great museums, schools, and other informal education organizations around the country doing amazing work to te teach and encourage kids about STEM. We are going forward to the moon, and to get us there and onto Mars, we need you, the Artemis generation, to be the next scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians to take us further than we have ever gone before. To learn more, you can go to our website at www.nasa.gov forward slash STEM, and you can join our online conversation using the hashtag NASA STEM on Facebook and Twitter. We will leave you now with a song from NASA's collection of moon tunes. Thanks for watching, and have a great weekend. Cause you light up the pie.